Hi, everybody, welcome. Oh, let me just admit some people to this meeting. People are just showing up for class. I'm Aurora. This is a Lessons for Full Spectrum Humans. For anyone who's watching this video who's new, I'm a galactic walk-in. This is my original curriculum that I developed over 10 years ago to be able to share my gifts with the world, expertise that I have about the shape of time and the specialty that I share with you, which is called the Flying Rainbow Lasagna. So we're about um, two months into the semester so far. It's never too late to join. It's never too late to enroll. I'm so pleased whenever people hop on board at any point. And when you enroll in my class, you have essentially a lifetime membership. Like you never have to enroll again. So even if the semester is quite far along, come in, don't wait, because you know why? You need this information now. And it's incredibly relevant to your individual levels of personal spiritual attainment and also where we are in terms of planetary ascension. And I always keep I always keep things um, relevant to whatever is the energetic weather report of the day, whatever we are facing, whatever challenges you're facing, this is the most updated um, sharing that I can possibly give to you. And I'll always contrast my present level of understanding with the lessons that I recorded 10 years ago, which are beautiful lessons that are like a classic outfit that stands the test of time. But, and I recorded them from that standpoint of a pristine system, working within a pristine system. I wouldn't say naivete, but I would just say the presum presumption of a just orderly world, which you don't inhabit right now. So sometimes I do what is a self rant when I talk about how what I presented 10 years ago I would never want to be taken out of context and I want it to be accurately applied to what you're presently experiencing. And that definitely relates to today's lesson. Today's class is level two, lesson five. It is about the origins of solar consciousness. We are going to talk all about sun gazing. That's not actually part of this um, particular lesson, but I want to jump ahead and give you um, all the information that I can on that because Sun gazing is absolutely essential. And it's uh, what you need to be doing right now to kind of fuel your light body to be able to go forward. So before I jump into my curriculum of today, so invite, invitement, I wanted to say invitation rather for everyone to enroll if you're not formally enrolled, because you can always catch my lessons here on YouTube. And I'm always pleased and grateful when people do that. However, when you enroll, it means that you have access to all the whiteboards from 10 years ago. And there's so many more details and so many things that I can't always cover, even though my classes tend to run like three or four hours sometimes. Um, it's essential to be able to get all of that detailed information and then compare it to what I'm talking about here today. Wait, Master Cheeky just got up. That's my little dog Cheeky over there. It's way too early in class because we literally just did our WALK at the PARK. So I think that she's just getting a drink of water. She will go back to her dog bed soon. And um, let me just also begin with a little bit of housekeeping because that's my housekeeping in quotes announcements. Um, you know, I always joke about this, this, um, these lessons are sponsored by Aurora's Dehydrated Broccoli, but also I have important stuff that I have a wonderful retreat coming up in mid-May. It's May 13th of this year, and that's in Sedona, Arizona. So I don't live in Sedona. I visited there uh, last year at the end of the year, had a wonderful experience and expressed my interest in being able to return in order to teach. The area has a wonderful natural energy and it's optimum flight conditions for being able to do, and the flying rainbow lasagna is a verb, a thing that you do to do the flying rainbow lasagna. So things like having a positive environment to be able to do it in, and what do I mean by that? It means not as much electro smog, not a lot of overhead power lines, um, not a lot of the deployment of suppression technologies, things that are ostensibly for telecommunications, but are actually for the diminishment of your divine connection and diminishment of human consciousness. Um, a lot less of that there. And Sedona is a wonderful natural area or area that has nat naturally high levels of um, elevating energy. It's a wonderful place. It's absolutely beautiful. So yeah, I chose that intentionally. I will have retreats here in Ojai, California, where I live. Um, but um, I'll tell you, California is not optimum flight conditions. It's very, very challenging. In fact, driving back from Arizona, as soon as I cross the California border, you come into this place where it's like 
tons of overhead power lines and all of the, the psychic sprawl of Los Angeles. And my little town is kind of outside of that, but you have to drive through that to get to my town. It's just, it's a very difficult place. Like if you're a runner, you want to live someplace that's like nice and warm and sunny and you can get out and do your running every day. It's very, very cold. If you live someplace like Alaska, where it's like frozen and you don't really want to go outside that much sometimes. So California is definitely a place where sometimes it is very challenging to do the flying rainbow lasagna, but Sedona is optimum conditions. So I have um, rented a large retreat space there. We have enough room for about between 10 and 15 participants. Private chef, Chef Dave War, he owns the chocolate tree and the giving tree in, um, one is in Sedona and one is in Phoenix, which are amazing vegetarian restaurants. It will not be a vegetarian retreat, but we will have all of the highest quality, organic nourishing foods that will all be included as part of the cost to participate and different levels of um, lodging is the best word I have for it. Everything from the least expensive and most simple thing you can do, which is simply to camp out, which will be very comfortable. It will be more like glamping, glamorous camping, not arduous camping, because you can just simply set up a small tent and be able to sleep outside, optimum weather conditions for that time of year, and then use all the amenities inside, including you know, bath, running water, bathroom facilities, and of course, all of our meals will all be communal. That's a big part of what I have envisioned in this. So not to spend too much of our class time to go to, to this, but because uh, I'll, I'll record separate videos inviting you to the retreat. But my envisionment for this is that I want to bring people through the same activities that I do every day in order to optimize your natural flying rainbow lasagna energy or bring forward your natural gifts. So these are the things that I do every day, everything from getting up and doing sun gazing, what we're going to talk about in class today, to what type of food I eat and when. So I'm actually creating the menu based upon my um, knowledge and practical uh, application of what I know about the human metabolism at this point. And then um, doing walking and talking, like, you know, I'm always walking on a treadmill. I don't even tell you at this point, but you guys are like, why is it we're bouncing up and down like this? I walk on my treadmill now while I do all of my Zooms and classes and, and personal sessions. It's actually very, very wonderful and very positive for my body. Um, so we'll have walk and talks is what I call it. Walking at a slow, comfortable pace while I um, give an informative lecture or sharing or have a QA. and a And um, we're also going to do, I call it light exercises because it's light not heavy lifting, but it's also light for your light body. So bringing people through the actual physical body cultivations that I do each day that help to facilitate the actual dance of the flying rainbow lasagna and then sun gazing at night and then communal meals. So um, it's going to be an amazing opportunity also to socialize, spend some time forming bonds of friendship and positive interactions with other participants who will be there um, because that's also a big part of, um, as I was uh, creating this retreat, considering what are the things that would inspire a person to travel possibly very far to be able to come and be there in person? Why is it better than having a video meeting like this? And the answer is the personal connection of being in my energy field, being able to have wonderful nourishing lasagna food, being in a not physical lasagna, although we might have that on the menu, but lasagna, you know, energy food, being in a place where there's optimum conditions for flight, because this retreat is amazing. It's out outside, slightly outside of Sedona by about 10 minutes and a big giant blue open sky, no overhead power lines. You can really, you will be able to really get up, out and expand your energy field. And um, then also socializing, meeting with other people. You, you know, a lot of people confide in me that they feel like they're the only sane person in their community or the only person who is seeing some of the extraordinary irregularities. Wait, let me grab my 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 piece of paper here. There, oh, okay, oh, I have to grab this without knocking everything else over. Hold on a second. Wait, patience, please. Patience, please. Where did my piece of paper go? Oh my goodness. Hold on one moment. It's a very important piece of paper that has slipped behind somewhere. You know what I'm always holding up in order to talk about this. Oh, this is too funny. Well, to write a new note or something like that, because I don't know where the magical piece of paper has gone to. But the note that I usually hold up, wait a minute. Let me write it on a piece of paper. But someplace far away from there. Wait. Yeah, I'm, I'm totally, totally losing my groove because I have to write down this on my paper over here. Hold on a second.
Okay. That stuff. Sorry, I don't know where my magical piece of paper went. Um, uh, being able to communicate with others effectively, some people who might not even be very aware of this stuff that's going on. You might feel like you're the only person in the world who knows you're not. And uh, we will have an amazing opportunity to come together as a group. And also it's time acrobatics. And I tell people that it's not merely posturing. What we're doing is not just a practice like dress rehearsal. We do very real things that uh, genuinely influence reality in the most positive ways. So Sedona also as a central hub to radiate outward um, positive, um, um, positive, uh, energy cultivations that we're doing. I just lost my train of thought because Joyce, hi jo Joyce, so great to see you and thank you always for the positive blessings. Says, call it Mork. <laughs> Is that like Nanu Nanu Mork from Ork? That's an old TV show, possibly before some of your time, um, but an alien that was here, but I don't know if it relates to him. He was kind of a friendly doofus of an alien. He wasn't that evil, but this stuff is definitely evil. And uh, I have ongoing um, yeah, I have many ongoing theories about what it is. Um, yeah, so uh, just just putting all that naughty stuff aside, please consider coming to my retreat. It's going to be amazing, uplifting, and very nourishing on a variety of levels for you personally and for us as the group that is there and for our whole entire world. So I invite and encourage each one of you to come. And uh, again, I'll, I'll record all the details in a separate video, but uh, you'll have to fly into either Phoenix or Flagstaff, and then we will have shuttles or um, ways to be able to pick you up and bring you into the airport if you're not driving in. So we will help you with the details of being able to actually arrive at the retreat. Okay. Housekeeping is done. Thank you so much. Now it's time to move on to my actual curriculum. And let me pull up my notes over here. Um, uh, so, you know, it was really um, lovely, but also sad. Um, someone found one of my original videos from one of my earliest semesters. This is from 2014. I had just come to California and I actually rented a small, um, like a classroom so I could do my teaching in person. And so if you check out this video and I'll link to it in the in the description so you can um, feel it firsthand. I was uh, teaching to live students in the class, but then also some people had tuned in from their various places around the country. And you could see it's pretty low tech. I didn't have all of my whiteboards and everything totally perfect yet, but that's not what made me sad. What made me sad, because this person, commented on the video from 10 years ago and they're like oh what a hidden gem so of course I'm re-watching it and kind of going back into the feeling state I'm connecting to who I was in that moment and the topic was all about sun gazing and solar consciousness what I'm teaching you guys about this right now except it's 10 years later and uh, it made me feel very sad and angry because the entire quality of access to the sun solar intelligence solar nourishment, nourishment for your light body, and everything that should be your birthright has been totally peed and pooped upon and is very diminished right now. When I tune back into the energy of that time and I remember what my sun gazing practice was like, it was so much easier for me to actually connect with the sun, even though at that point I lived in Northern California, which is notoriously cloudy, notoriously foggy, not very sunny like Southern California, which is where I live now, it's why I moved here. But uh, even in the cloudy and rainy uh, environment of that place, I was able to do a lot more effective sun gazing and solar connection than I've been able to do here, even in what is considered one of the sunniest cities in Southern California, San Diego. I was there for a year. I said like I did time, like I did a year in San Diego because it was such a place of imprisonment. Why, why do I say that? Because even though it was half a block from the beach and I thought, oh, I'm gonna be able to see the sun so easily. I'm gonna sun gaze every day, walk half a block and stand right there and get that energy into my pineal gland. You know what? It was almost impossible to do so. Why? because it's not just about optical connection, it is about energetic connection. And that city is so locked down in terms of the telecommunication frequencies, the millimeter wave that is everywhere there. And it's, in, it's all up and down the California coast. It's all up and down the, the Pacific Coast Highway. It's all up and down every beach. There's pretty much no place where you can go. I think I went to one place 
that was along the coast over there. That is a place where they do these um, paragliding missions. And so there's no overhead power lines. And it's just, you go out onto these cliffs. That was the only place where I had peace of mind and solar connection. Every place else is locked down. And when I say that, what I mean is there's a consciousness diminishment frequency that makes it incredibly difficult to connect with the sun. So let me just draw this for you. Because, wait, okay, let me do this for privacy. Good. Uh, annotation, annotation, annotation. God, you guys know me by now. Cringe every time. Like, no, she lost the annotation. Don't worry, guys, let's get it back. Okay. Annotation, annotation, annotation. Good. Okay, so first let's draw you. This is you, one of my famous stick figures, right? And then, well, you have very long arms. Okay, you have long asymmetrical arms. And um, bear with me, wait, a different color. Come on, silly thing. Just this. Okay, here's the sun, beautiful sun in the sky. And here's, this is a child's drawing. Beautiful sun rays. And one of them, of course, should come like directly, whoops into your pineal gland here and be nourishing you. This is what should be going on. But in this time that we are living in, you've got a couple of different things that are barriers. This is familiar with you. This is the stuff. This is this stuff. Brown cuckoo, poo poo caca color. So I'm drawing this. This is what's in the actual body, specifically up here around your pineal gland. That's the first thing that you've got actual fibers and things that are in the body. And it's not like they're just inert fibers. They have a deleterious action on your natural biofield, which is a force field of energy that is both created by your physical somatic cellular presence and also supports your physical somatic cellular presence. So it is living energetic force field that is part of the miracle of all of your somatic cells and how your blood flows, how your cells do cell-to-cell -cell communication, your cell membranes, your mitochondria, all of those um, five senses, um, measurable activities that happen in that level have a beautiful measurable energy field beyond the ephemeral energy that we would call prana and life force and chi, which is not measured by the five senses and is not recognized by science. But these little fibers things, they have a negative action on the health and vitality of your natural biofield. And then you also have something that we will just draw now as stink lines. <laughs> You know, like from Charlie Brown, that kid who had stink lines coming off of him. These are stink lines that represent um, ephemeral blockades between the sun at its source, the real sun, um, coming into you. That's the stuff that gets emitted. Like there's all these fr frying towers, like telecommunication supposed towers, but they are really made for the purposes of, um, you know, fr frying you um, into submission and so you've got stuff that's implanted in your body, then you've got stuff that is surrounding you in the environment that is part of electrosmog or frequency soup or any of the shorthand that people might talk about. And then you've also got, let's get a different color. Uh, although I enjoy the color pink, I'm just using this as a representation of a sun that is not the real sun. In front of the regular sun, you then have this false sun that is really not quite the right color. I should make it blue or something like that because the light that it emits really is more of a blue light. It's more like staring at an LED screen or a computer screen or something like that. It is not the natural sunlight. And that is literally in front of, like an imposter in front of the natural sun. And then uh, finally, if you get through all of those layers and all those barriers, then you do have the beautiful natural sun over here. All right. So this is why I was sad and angry when I watched that old video. On the one hand, I felt like so poignant. Here, I'll go back to my face. I felt so poignant because I was like, oh, I can't remember what that used to feel like. I used to get out in the field, like, you know, like a nice, large, large open area, kind of at the end of my driveway every day. And I would make it part of my, my daily, not ritual, but my lifestyle and how I organized my day to be able to take this time to commune with the sun. And I used to get great 
inspiration, for creativity and athleticism and painting and all of the ideas that I share with people. It's a touchstone of my day, a big part of how I do things. And um, within the past three to five years, that has totally diminished. And it's because of all the things that I just showed to you that are pretty much 100% technological obstacles to connection with the true sun. And although the flying rainbow lasagna is a very, very effective tool that you can use to jump up and over and past obstacles, uh, cause you've got your tendril of attention. I always use this as my little tendril of attention. So you've got like this, uh, you know, like a long, like a sensor, a sensor, a feeler, something that comes outward from your inner eye. And this is an ephemeral or non-physical aspect of your anatomy that also can use to reach across vast distances. It is non-local to time and space. You can reach out with your tendril of attention, but the implanted fibers and um, surrounding uh, force fields make it very difficult to do that. They have made it difficult to reach out with your tendril of attention and they have made it difficult to do the flying rainbow lasagna, which is like jumping over a hurdle, like jumping, that interdimensional jumping. It takes energy to do that. You gotta be like, duh, 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 jump, do it. Um, and uh, it ain't that easy, kid. And so, yeah, there's a bunch of anti-lasagna infrastructure that has been deployed. So it would be very, very facile for me to be like, oh, don't worry about that, kids. Just jump right over all of those obstacles and connect with the sun. Dust off your hands. Everything will just be great because I have I'm here in solidarity with you and I'm an expert. I'm a really good hurdle jumper in terms of my energy and my energy field, and my consciousness. And I find it very, very difficult to connect with the sun. So sad, angry and disappointed at the difficulties that all of us face. And especially in my sense of being very protective uh, of you as you are in your developmental processes to get up to speed, to get to the point where you activate your inner eye and are able to connect directly to the sun and are able to have those levels of nourishment and empowerment. It's like, there's a lot of things that aren't fair and they are especially keenly unfair to you because you are still trying to build your muscles to be able to do this interdimensional jumping and connecting to the sun and, the, and essentially the source. So that's the next question and answer. Aurora, why do, with attitude or without attitude, why do I even wanna jump to the sun? What's so great about this? And the answer is you get a ton of energy from doing it. And it's not just some kind of abstraction, like ho-hum, that's a lot of nice energy. It is very, very practical, applicable energy. It is number one, energy that is life force energy that helps keep you healthy and alive. You're feeding your light body is 100% pro-life. It brings you towards levels of coherence where your light waves and biological architecture fit together perfectly and longevity. It helps you to continue going forward in time. It is a very, very health promoting, life affirming activity just on the biological level. It is also hugely emotionally uplifting that it gives you a very positive feeling inside um, better than any biochemical antidepressant or drug that a person might take. I will just go forward and say, like, I don't think you even really want those drugs. I think what you really want is just real sunlight, but that you're in this place where it's been, uh, you're in the can, like you're like sealed up and it's been uh, lo locked away from you, which is all a criminal activity and very, very unfair and very horrible. And um, it's also where you get new ideas and the impetus to jump onto new, improved and better timelines. So the sun emits time and it doesn't just do so in a contextless void. The sun is connected on a vast network of consciousness that can be considered a great brain that is from your viewpoint in the sky. You know, you're looking upward at the night sky and you see all these little points of light and you can consider the entire star field and all of those stars to be like um, neurons that you are seeing that are in connection. So that's a big takeaway because stars don't act as mere separated individuals. Well, let me even go further because human science says like stars are like a giant ball of plasma in the sky. It's a big, giant, hot nuclear furnace. Like it's hot and, you know, stuff spews off of there. And that's 
very limited and very reductionist. It'd be like talking about you and your body and your, your life and saying, oh yes, you consume calories and then you emit heat signatures and you know sometimes solid waste. Like you do a lot more than that. So it doesn't recognize these very basic truths that the sun is a consciousness presence. It is incredibly sophisticated, although it is not infallible. And that's also a big takeaway emphasis for today's sharing here. The sun is a magnificent grand scale consciousness, and it is a neuron on a node of a larger meta, meaning overarching larger scale consciousness being that is divine. However, in our present world, stars as individuals and stellar consciousness can be flawed. It's not perfect can be still ignorant or in a state of self-exploration and learning. And this is essential because this is not part of the curriculum, but just part of my personal sharing. Along about 2019, I was really expecting that the sun would reach out much more actively in order to prevent what I jokingly call the subcutaneous pollutions. That, I mean, I saw the writing on the wall along with many other people, saw and sensed what was happening. And my great faith, my expectation, my baseline presumption was like, he, the, no star is going to let this happen. Because the sun, the stars, they are all connected. They are all hugely benevolent super beings with their SHIT together, not irresponsible at all, not uncaring at all. We are its creations. I'm going to talk more, more you know, uh, with more details about that. But um, absolutely responsible and responsive to the needs of us as biological entities and also the support of cosmic law and the infrastructure of cosmic law in um, maintaining reality. Like the sun and the stars are expert musicians in the symphony of life. They don't make biological organisms randomly. They don't make events randomly. We have to jump off my treadmill customary one, once per time. This time body that surrounds your body is made out of time and timelines and possibilities and probabilities and narrative story structures that are all emanated from the sun. And they're not random and they're not arbitrary and they're not um, cruel or unduly uncaring of you. They're actually very caring of you, very responsible. And I could not make sense of, I don't have the word for, that sun that is so perfect, that emanates time, that makes all of us come into existence, that supports the entire biological life infrastructure on our planet and in our, organizes our whole entire solar system, and the level of being out to lunch, inactivity in response to a campaign, a concerted campaign to put that stuff into people's bodies, back to here, this, do your thing. That stuff, just get a color here to put that stuff into people's bodies. And then also to put this stuff in front of the people's bodies that have that stuff in it. All of that is a huge crime. All of that is a huge assault on the biological art project that the sun has emanated and created and sustained here as part of its divine um, you know, alignment as a, a, a in exemplar of God or of divine intelligence and divine willpower. Like the sun would never let that happen. Do, 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 do. The sun would never let that happen. Do, 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 do. And then it happens. And the sun didn't stop it. This is again, just my personal sharing. I was very, very, um, I think validly disappointed because my expectation was that the sun would do something to more proactively protect its creation, protect the biological creatures that are here, protect life and protect DNA. And it is still unfathomable to me why the sun did not act more um, proactively, preventatively, or in response to the situation, because the sun is also not stupid. And also it's not based in linear time. The sun doesn't be, be like the way that you, as I spoke about in the past couple of lectures here, um, experience time in a linear sense where you're submerged, 
And you remember, yesterday is the past, today is the present, and tomorrow is the potentials of the future. But the sun is more like the editor in the movie of your life. Looking at every moment as all time is now. Let me just drink some water. So the sun can perceive the totality of you in each moment and doesn't have the limitations that you do as an organism swimming through time. The sun is really assessing the holistic presence of your whole entire life. And in light of that, um, I just couldn't, it was, it was inconceivable to me that uh, the sun would not be more active. And all these bad things happened. People got subcutaneous pollutions. Sky poops fell out of the sky anus. Fibers came into people. Giant um, infrastructures were erected that distance you from the sun. This is a big, 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 big no-no. This is the biggest no-no that it is possible to do. So um, I still don't have an answer for that. I just have my personal response that is from my lecture from two weeks ago where I've shared my disappointments and then simply said, I don't have an answer for why the sun or larger scale entities and levels of consciousness did not prevent this, didn't act more, more effectively or what happened and how this could possibly have happened. All I have is my response, which is I am going to do something with my equipment and with my willpower and I am augmented in each time I make that decision. So I don't have an answer, but I do have this to share with you. The sense that even the sun and the stars are mortal in this realm because you're in the realm of mortality and you are submerged in the world of matter and you're emerging from the world of matter and returning to eternal life where suns and stars never die and where you also never die. But you are here in this world where death is a possibility, although it is an aberration and a thing that you should never actually explore and experience. And the sun and the stars are still learning. So that's a big takeaway that although I have looked at them and presumed them to be perfected creatures, giant light bodies, because we talk about becoming an ascended master and what it is to be an ascended master as your personality is honed and refined as you're moving upward through this time spiral. And then you become perfectly in alignment with that central core timeline. And then you are the eternal version of yourself this shape is a microcosm that you can apply to any scale of organism. So the sun has a shape like this and it has the heliosphere that surrounds it. And it also has its own set of life potentials. And stars in this world can die and have a mortality event. If the sun is positioned incorrectly, it hits the membrane of death and has a mortality event and it dies. So the sun and the stars are all on a journey of self-exploration, learning and refinement, even as you in your body on a smaller level are on a journey of uh, self-exploration and personal refinement and soul refinement until you get back to your eternal truest nature. So the sun can make a mistake. The sun is still learning. The sun can make a mistake or do a miscalculation so bad that it actually dies. You have to comprehend that because I think that that is also a part of recognizing the sun as a living being in its own um, levels of self. Uh, it's, it's still learning and uh, that it can make a mistake. And because I, I want you to be like rely upon it 100%, but I have to admit that it appears that it can be fallible. And in that sense, then you must take personal responsibility and be like, oh, if that guy's making a mistake, that's his choice, but I'm gonna do things the right way, which is to do this, this, and this. And that's a very, very different framing of the relationship and the dynamics of the relationship between yourself and the sun than it is to say, the sun is like the perfect parent in the sky and you are its child or its offspring. And you defer to that parent in terms of authority, reality structure, and um, oh, oh, being obedient. That that's a different level. And you are coming out of the age of Pisces and the age of externalizing your um, authority figure to either an external parent, a mommy, a daddy, a school principal, a religious priest, Jesus, or some bearded man in the sky, or, or whatever is your conception of God or divinity. 
including the sun. And we'll talk in this lecture here all about sun worship and all about the you know, cultural origins of respect and loving the sun. But um, you must in this moment, because of this stuff that is going on, reach into levels of greater personal growth than being just a total child and maybe move into levels of what would be adolescence and young adulthood. That happens when you're an adolescent or a young adult that you kind of look around at older people and you're like, that guy just made a mistake. He doesn't know everything. Maybe I shouldn't just listen to everything they say as if it is um, the empirical truth. And maybe I should think for myself, maybe I should make my own decisions because the previous generation can be outright mistaken or it can be running programs that were effective for generations ago, but not for right now. And that that's an essential part of coming into your individuality and your own empowerment. So I think that we need to do something similar in our relationship and our dynamic to the sun, which is divine. It's flat out. This is, but this is not to say I'm like, God, I'm very disappointed in you. You know, like, God, I'm very disappointed in you. It's not to say that. It's to say that you recognize the sun as a manifestation of a divine creature that is exploring itself into greater levels of divine perfection and can make a mistake or be fallible or be inadequate or be not incomplete is a better word for it and to still be learning. And um, you have to take personal responsibility in saying, if that guy made a mistake and is still learning and I can see that there's a better way of doing things, I need to do things in a better way. And I need, I, I need to do something with my willpower of what is possible. So that, because this becomes a really difficult quagmire. So the things that made me sad and just de not depressed, because I didn't really get depressed, but like disappointed in watching that video are that we live in a present world where you're trying to grow and evolve and you're supposed to have your solar connection, divine connection and your connection to the sun and sunlight. And many forms of technology have been put in place it, throughout your body and your ground-based architecture and even the satellites around your planet that are preventing you from connecting with the sun and that the sun didn't do anything. Now I'm like turning into some whatever, hyperbolic comedian here, but uh, it, it blows your mind. Blah, I can't even believe it, that the sun wouldn't do something about that because the sun and stars are very incredibly responsible. It's being an artist of reality. When you're an artist of reality, you don't just make a bunch of organisms like, you know, sprinkle down some seeds in the garden and then just come back in six months and see if anything is alive. No, you don't do that. You oversee and care about and care for the minutia of every aspect of creating life. That's the whole idea of what is sun gazing, that you're supposed to be in a moment by moment constant rapport with the sun. Like now we have this language to be able to talk about this, doing a live stream. So not even just doing a recording. It's not even just like, huh, I'm gonna record my life and every single moment and event in my life. And then upon the moment of my death, return to the sun and be like, dun, 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 dun. here's my personal journal and everything I've been through. And the sun gets to be kind of like, thank you so much. I'm just internalizing that now and uh, learning all about the things that you've done because everything that we have comes from the sun or from another star that existed and has already gone through its death process. So that's literally everything from the um, elements, the atomic elements of your body, including water and aspects of your environment that sustain you, come from either this particular sun that presides over your present biological existence or from a sun that existed in what would be your deep antiquity. Gold, I didn't have a piece of gold to show you, but if you have a piece of gold, gold is literally like, I would say like the vomit that comes out at when a star is dying. Gold, like the most precious, beautiful thing that you've got uh, in this world, this hot commodity, and uh, it comes out of the death of a star. And gold is an incredibly positive, you know, healing um, molecule. It's shaped exactly like a star tetrahedron Merkaba. Um, so gold beyond its um, commodification level has a huge amount of energetic, you know, benefit to it. And, but beyond all of that, so like your calcium, um, all, all of the um, things that make up you and make up your environment 
come from the stars and then everything in this present body, that is spark of light that is your consciousness, your neurology, the electrical impulses that travel through your nerve system, uh, all of the light that you have in your body in the form of food. Like your, your body is made out of slowed down light, that you have a physical material presence that is really made out of light that is or are waveforms that move at the speed of light. But when you take those waveforms and you slow them down and solidify and condense them, then they become physical matter. Where does that light? So your body's made of matter. Let's do the logic tree. Body's made of matter. Matter is made of slowed down light. Where does the light come from? The light comes from the sun. So the stuff that is the slow down matter of slow down light of your body of matter that you are walking around in right now comes directly from the sun. And this is all on loan to you. It is gifted to you from the sun in the most amazing levels of generosity of a truly benevolent parent that truly does care about you and wants to give you the most exalted experience. And you come here and you are able to embody and be as a consciousness in the world through the, the use of these gifts from the stars. And what you're supposed to do is have a real time broadcast, a rapport in every moment. That was what was part of the brochure, brochure or intended experience in, in embodying and coming here that you would be able to consistently receive your signals from the sun and send back your feedback of what your experience here is like. So that, that not just for like random arbitrary reasons, so that the sun could fine tune your experience, optimize your education and bring you forward in longevity so that you would never have to die. That's the big thing. You were meant to always be connected to the sun, that the sun, if it sensed anything was going to happen, disease or accident or an attack on who you are that you would be safeguarded because you have this um, enormously wise is the word I'm looking for and attentive parental or, or originator type of figure that really truly cares about you and is looking out for you and is not going to let bad stuff happen to you. And the presumption is just like, if you can just have communication with that wise creature that uh, it would immediately send out an improved timeline. So the analogy I usually use is if you were like driving your car, you're about to hit a brick wall and you're able to send a signal to the sun and the sun is like, oh, S-H-I-T, that's part of me down there having an experience, photons as feelers, and it's about to hit a brick wall. I got to do something. So then the sun sends out a corrective timeline experience that allows you to you know, miraculously or inexplicably turn the wheel of your car or something else happens so that you don't hit the brick wall, you don't get in a horrible accident and you don't die. And really most of the diseases and deaths and accidents by misadventure that have happened have been because people have been genetically modified to not have an effective communication with the sun in real time, that that's not your fault. You actually have to work very, very hard in terms of superseding the genetic modification and the squashing and limitations that have happened to you. That's where flying rainbow lasagna comes in. Genetic modifications to humanity, you are able to supersede or rectify things that make it so that your pineal gland wasn't fully functional or your light body wasn't fully connected to the sun or your metabolism wasn't fully functional in one or another multiple ways. And to be able to rectify all of that so that you get faster. And when you are fast enough, then you're in this real-time rapport with the sun so that that way you're getting all of the food, nutrition, and guidance that you need. And the sun is also receiving from you all of this energy and information that is hugely valuable in the moment. Like uh, the sun is truly the conductor, like the way you have a musical conductor, like tap, tap, tap. Okay, I'm conducting the orchestra. So let's say life on earth and life in the solar system is the orchestra of this place. And the sun is the art artist creator in the studio, created all of these amazing life forms and then organizes them and tells them like you play, tubas play, flutes don't play, be quiet. 
you know, whatever, timpani faster, violin slower, and organizes and coordinates all of that. But that is a time-based effort. So you guys know, like when you listen to music, it involves time. You have to be at the right tempo. And it takes a lot to mesh together all of the players so that it actually sounds good and sounds like music. It's actually a huge artistic progress to be able to do that. In opposition to, you can't really see my studio that well in the lighting here today, but looking at a painting, it's like when you look at this painting, like you see the whole painting at once. It's not like, first I will show you the green, and then I will show you the yellow, and then I will show you the pink, and then I will show you the black, and then I will show you this. That's not how it works. You see a painting all at once. It's not a time-based experience, but music, first I hear these notes, and then I hear these notes, and then I hear these notes. It's based in time. So if you don't have a real time connection to the sun, the sun is limited in its effectiveness and ability to coordinate not only you, but all of these organisms from the tiniest microbe into the grandest scale multicellular organism into even all life on earth, everything that's going on in your biosphere of your planet is supposed to be directly coordinated by the sun. Uh, you know, not anything accidental, everything really like intentionally placed and intentionally timed to create beautiful time tapestries. That was the intention for what this embodiment art project would be like. So the sun and stars, in order to be in their position, they must be very responsible you don't just get to be a sun or a star, just like being a crappy, irresponsible person without doing very good work. Like you earn it. It's like being the first chair in violins or in a symphony. <laughs> you earn it through excellence. And you live in a very corrupt world where people receive all sorts of benefits without receiving them in excellence. But the rest of the world is not that way. So you live in a very, um, I don't have words for it but uh, incomprehensibly poorly structured level of reality where sometimes good people are punished and bad people get away with stuff. And uh, um, people also achieve sometimes high levels, high state, high levels of responsibility and station, social station without having earned them at all through their excellence. Can, you can laugh like a lot of politicians and also a lot of musicians and artists. I mean, I actually have to say this in your world, like the people in museums are not necessarily the best artists. The songs on the radio are not necessarily the best musicians. The people that are your leaders are not necessarily the wisest, most caring, most adept leaders. You're like, duh, Aurora, we know that. I'm like, I know you know that. Yeah. <laughs> but what I must inform you of is that Outside of this realm, higher levels of galactic community, energy flows to excellence. If you do something good, it is recognized. Everything is seen. If you do something crappy, it is recognized. You know, I worked at this one job and the other guy threw the extension cord into the supply closet. And I'm like, just you get to do, you can do this. You got to wrap up the electrical cord in the perfect figure eight way and then put it in there neatly so it's ready for the next person. And that guy was like this. And I'm like, I'm gonna wrap up that cord. And uh, that guy would not be ready to be a sun or a star because he's like, just throw it, sweep it under the carpet. Don't care, doing a half-ass job. And I'm like, I'm using my whole ass, all right? So when you do the utmost that is within your willpower and your capacitation in higher dimensional galactic civilizations, that is recognized. And they're like, ah, oh, that one. I want you to promote that one there that properly wrapped up the electrical cord. And this other guy, he doesn't get punished, but what happens is he just doesn't get opportunities. And if he wants to get opportunities, he's gonna have to kind of be like, well, how come that person got advanced? And now is a, a big giant sun radiating all of these timelines and creating amazing time architecture. Like how come I'm not creating time architecture? And then he's gonna be like, maybe it's cause I didn't, do the things I'm supposed to do and do my responsibilities and serve others. And I just cared about my own convenience. Maybe that's what it was. And then hopefully 
come to levels of self-realization and growth. So again, that's how it works on a higher dimensional level. So it's not reward and punishment. It is really re recognition of excellence and that is how elevation happens. So with that presumption, because that's the level of reality that I emanate from, I'm like, okay, if you're a sun or a star, like you're there because you're excellent. You have done a good job. You have cleaned up the entire supply closet. You organized everything for everyone and you earned your place to be there because creating biological life is a huge responsibility. So again, I'm in this world where I can say, it's just like being a parent and you guys are all gonna laugh behind your hand like, there's plenty of people who are not responsible parents. This is sadly true. There are plenty of people in the physical world that you live in that is a very diseased world where they are not responsible parents, but ostensibly in a healthy realm, whatever level of reality you're inhabiting, that if you are a parent, if you create and generate life and give birth to something, if it is a bio biological person or if it is a project or if it is some other kind of edifice or architecture, you are responsible to your creation. And that means you care for it. Again, you don't just create some kind of a thing, toss it over your shoulder, and then be like, see you suckers, I'm on to the next thing. You care for your creation. So if you plant seeds, you care for the garden and you water it. If you make people or dogs or cats, you care for them and make sure that they have their foods and kibbles and whatever they need to be happy and healthy. And if you make time, you don't just be like, oh, just, I just made a bunch of time noodles. Who cares? You're like, trying to make it perfect, trying to make the time architecture perfect. So if you're not at that level of taking things seriously, personal self-responsibility, energy, excellence, and really being um, you know, very, very invested in the outcome of what you made, like you don't belong in the art studio. You don't belong in the creator's driver's seat the way that the sun and the stars are there, which is again, why I had a huge disconnect because I'm like, I know these guys are supposedly the best of the best. How could they not be looking after their creation? So um, I'm just sharing with you openly there because I think that I would be very irresponsible if I didn't share that with you. If I handed you some kind of candy coating, like, you know, the stuff that I shared 10 years ago is very real to my experience from 10 years ago. I recognize the genetic mutilations of this world, but you didn't yet have the lockdown of frequency and the in, inhabitation of fibers in your body that pretty much makes you cut off from the sun and from the galactic center and from the source of divine consciousness and willpower. And that those that level of disconnect from those levels of sustenance is a complete aberration, is a complete thing that should never happen, it is incomprehensible that that would ever happen in light of or in context or relevance to the hugely responsible levels of wisdom and clarity that it takes to become a sun or a star. They cannot be out to lunch. It is like a, a job description. They must be attentive to their creation. They must be responsible and responsive for the re 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 repercussions. You make stuff happen in time. You're a sun or a star and you're radiating a bunch of timelines and a bunch of stuff is happening. You have to take responsibility for what you radiate, for what you make happen. You can't just sit there and be like, it's not my, not my job. <laughs> Snap with attitude. It is your job. And it's everybody's job. It's all of the sun and all of the stars job. So even if your star is having a problem, all the rest of the stars are responsible because why? Because one brain, one, sorry, I said it wrong. One neuron does not make a brain. You have many, many neurons working together that make a brain. One sun or one star does not make a stellar network. Stellar network means you have many, many, many stars, hugely wise and responsible creatures of an enormous lifespan all working together. So if you had a misfiring of one neuron, the rest of the neurons are going to get together and say, we need to do something because a wrong thought came out of that neuron over there. We need to correct this pattern. We need to act in order to send out the uh, corrected codes or restructuring of reality that that thought perturbed so that that way you still have a reality. Cause you get it? Like I, I called up that electrical wire because I'm like, you know something, um, actions have consequences. 
I don't coil up this thing, the next guy's gonna have a problem. That's the beginning at the, the level of a small human of recognizing actions have consequences, consequences, consequences. So if you're gonna be a time being, right? The sun is a time being. It is creating and emanating time and timelines. You could think of it on your anthropocentric model as writing stories. And the stories that it writes are not arbitrary stories. Because when I use the word story and imagination, you go into, oh, like, anything can happen. Like Willy Wonka or something like that. Like the world of pure imagination, like nothing makes sense, anything can happen. Um, it's not like that. It is hugely responsible for you to imagine and create with your mind things that actually come into being and that these are not random and not arbitrary because everything is connected. So the reason, because it, it, it's it's a physical world, not just an imaginary, uh, arbitrary astral dreamland. So this is the difference between physical reality and just uh, a mind created reality or a purely imaginative, purely, I should say a fantasy realm. Fantasy realm, again, you could imagine that like, my face is made of purple cupcakes. And then a unicorn flies by in the background. No, unicorns don't fly. Pegasus flies by in the background. And then Jimi Hendrix is playing music. None of it makes sense. It doesn't have to make sense. It's just a fantasy. But the timelines and emanations, the music that the sun and the stars emanate are more than mere fantasy. They are imaginations that have a pristine, perfect way of integrating and coming together that supports life. In order to have a body, like the bodies that we presently inhabit, none of this happens by accident. It's all very, very, very much on purpose. Like my paintings, nothing happens by accident. Like I actually sit there with a ruler and measure this stuff. I do this stuff on purpose. It takes a lot of effort and care to make it look that way. So human or surface level science right now, it's not really sophisticated enough to be able to recognize the levels of care that are deployed in the creation of bio and sustenance of the physical realm and biological architecture. But when you get to be more sophisticated and have better tools for perception and measurement, you will be able to measure everything the way that you could look at my paintings and measure everything with a little set of calipers and be like, wow, like this is exactly the same. And this matches and this matches. You could bring your measuring system and your calipers to like a beach and you could measure the way that ocean waves are rolling in and the structure of the sand. And you'd be like, it's all perfect. It's all put together in the most perfect ways that is not by accident. So what science, your, your science presently looks at and presumes things to be chaotic, quote unquote chaotic or random or blah, blah, it's not. It's just, you don't have the sophistication to be able to read the language that is being presented to you. But there's most definitely a sophisticated and complex language that is the structure of reality. That's part of what I'm trying to awaken you to and teach you about so that you can be literate. So everything about what I'm trying to teach you here is about to get you up to speed so that you can send out your own tendril of attention, touch on the sun and get the ideas and energy that you need. It's the whole point of who and what I am as a teacher. So instead of me saying like, well, I'm gonna be like, take that eyedropper with like baby bird food and like drop it into your mouth, drop, drop by drop. And then you, that's how you're gonna learn. It's actually not what I want my role to be because if I do that, then you are continually disempowered, you know, like waiting for the food to come into your mouth, but not in, in the capacitation to reach out for what you want. What I want is to just get you up to speed so that your higher faculties are online or awakened and you have your tendril of attention that can reach out to the sun and then you can tap in directly. That is my job. And I have this job because this world, I want to say is kaka poo poo doo doo. This is not the way it's supposed to be. So you need to either be told like that, you need to do this, why there is stuff blocking your way, how to get over and past the stuff. So um, my job increased in the past 10 years because you don't even have just the regular obstacles that you have to get over. Cause I was like flying rainbow lasagna, let's get over those obstacles. You know, uh, now you got other obstacles that are like really crappy. 
making it difficult for you to do something that should be easy and fun and joyous and hugely nourishing and sustaining. So I'm going to get out of that feeling state. I actually felt it much more keenly last week. And I was like, I'm ready to rant or cry. I was ready to rail and storm against things in here. But um, I think I've done a good job of portraying my true feelings to you. I have conflicted feelings, but nonetheless, I continue onward with my own levels of personal responsibility. Um, it's hugely empowering to be informed as to the true nature of what is the sun, what are stars, what is stellar consciousness. In the past, humans have worshiped the sun as a genuine face of God. And I think that that's apt, although your present level of human industrialized society condescends to that viewpoint and says, those silly savages, they wore loincloths, they presented themselves to the sun and worshiped it as if it is, um, you know, a, a live being, ah, ha, 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 how silly to personify the sun and to, you know, ask it for assistance in your life because the, you know, reductionist industrialized model is like, oh yes, agricultural societies who pray to the sun. Oh sun, please make our crops grow. Oh sun, please, you know, make sure that our, our biosphere stays balanced and we can have, have food in our, you know, whatever grain silos. Um, but it's so much more than that. So like I'm thinking about ancient Egypt as one example, actually a very beautiful, sophisticated society that I have a ton of ties with and the quote unquote worship would be considered a respectful rapport with the consciousness that comes from the sun. I've spoken about this in previous semesters, the sun bark of Ra, a boat that is considered to sail across the ocean of the sky during the day, containing the souls of the exalted, the righteous dead that ride upon that boat along with the God who is named Ra in their world. Not a total endorsement of everything from ancient Egypt, Definitely not a total endorsement of the raw materials. It's a modern channel book that I think is hugely flawed. But the sophistication of their knowledge and their connection to the sun is much greater than it is presumed in the society that you come out of, especially from the late 1800s when you know it, electricity and industrialization really began into your present level of technology-based society that pretty much just I want to say, uh, diminishes the validity and need of the sun. Because you guys have electric lights, got it? In a time before electricity, the sun really ruled everything. If you want to do something, you do it when there is sunlight out. Otherwise, you've got like a candle. You're not going to get a lot done after the sun goes down. And when the invention of electric lights, um, human empowerment and human prioritization changed. And all of a sudden you could do stuff after the sun goes down, you could sew a dress and read a book and do all these different things that you used to only be able to do when the sun was out. And um, humans began to structure their lives differently and everything was not centered around the availability of the sun and of sunlight. But I think that is unhealthy both in your psychology, emotional presence, and biology. And I want you to return to living a lifestyle and structuring your day around the natural sun. Even though I was trying to figure out how I would portray this to you, even though the sun has something fake in front of it. So we who are older than 20 years old, you don't have to raise your hand. <laughs> I want to joke. I'm be like, if you're older than 20, raise your hand, but no. Because we have wonderful people in this class from like little tiny baby infants. And I'm so pleased that your parents watch and you know have you on board with us. And we we hug it, we hug and snug, you little babies. We've also we've got some young people and teenagers and some people who might be in their early 20s. Who, if you are at of that age group, then you might not remember what the pure sun looks and feels like in the sky. And I'm happy that there are those of us who are older than 20 years old to be able to explain to you and describe to you what the sun is actually supposed to look and feel like, even the different inequalities from, let's say, the sun of 10 years ago. 
it, when I lived in Woodstock, you know, over 10 years ago, the sun had its own particular quality. And even when I first moved to Northern California, 2014, just about 10 years ago, and I started to record these classes, the sun had its own particular quality. Here's what it felt like to me when I had a healthy connection with the healthy sun. The sun was a golden yellow color, a gentle nourishing color. When I presented myself to the sun, the feeling of its rays on my skin felt warm and nourishing and supportive and positive and healthy and life affirming. And similarly, when I would sun gaze, and I, I'll tell you all about how to sun gaze, but I do it a lot of the time with a hat over my eyes, or with my eyelids closed, you still get plenty of light into your body, even if you sun gaze with your eyelids closed. And um, I felt like it was very gentle, although very intense, that I felt like I was connecting with something that is a loving presence that was going into what I would describe my light body, like my circulatory system of light throughout my body. And I described that already today giving me really great ideas, giving my um, body a lot of wonderful energy, giving me a type of food that is beyond the food that we buy in the supermarket, a spiritual uplift, a feeling of exaltation, and also a feeling like that I could just go all day. There were a couple of moments when I would be like out for a walk and the sun would be going down, it would be going directly into my inner eye and I'd be walking along and I would just be like, wow, like if I could just keep going like this, I think I could just keep going forever. And that is really what the eternal journey feels like. Um, when you have enough light, which is consciousness and information and sustenance, and it is flowing directly into you. You don't feel tired, you don't feel hungry, you don't feel thirsty and you feel like, wow, like I could walk or run for forever. I can just keep going. And that is your true nature. And that is what you will evolve or return to as your truest state. All right. So that's the way that it used to feel like to me. And then, um, you know, since they started doing um, telecommunications towers and infrastructure, I found like it was more difficult for me to connect, but I still did it. So that was like around 2015, 2017. And even when I was, you know, in a more urban area in 2017, I was still able to make a connection because they hadn't yet rolled out the millimeter wave 5G grid. And within the past three or four years, it has been the most difficult that it's ever been for me to connect with the real sun. And then there is this light that is in the sky that is different than the natural sunlight. And the light that is in the sky now appears whitish or bluish and feels on my skin like a hot frying or sizzling type of feeling. Definitely very hot and uncomfortable for it to go into my eyes. Very uncomfortable for it to go onto the top of my head. I would feel like the top of my head is frying a lot. So um, not a gentle, nourishing, positive light source but something that really felt to me more like dangerous and more like an assault. And also I wasn't getting the same level of nourishment and sustenance and um, ideas. In my, in my heyday, when I would sun gaze, I would get so many ideas. Some of them would be translated into my visionary artwork, but a lot of it was translated into the curriculum that I share with you as this class. Like if you wanna know where my curriculum came from, it literally came from sitting down in my garden, um, doing sun gazing, getting ideas from the sun. And then I would have like my assignment for the day. And some people, you know, would write a book or a treatise or something like that. But for me, I would record these whiteboards and I'd be like, okay, this is what I'm going to tell everybody about. And uh, that's exactly what, what my ideal job is, like taking the abstraction of light and sunlight from the sun and the stars and then translating it into verbal communications and diagrams and things that other people can learn from and read. And uh, it's been so long since I've been able to do that. So I am going to restart my class that's called The Path of Light. I did that getting new curriculum ideas two years ago when I first came back to Ojai from San Diego, which is hell. And um, was, I did get some good communication with the stars, but I just got like a brief appetizer, not the real meals, that I used to eat every day. And for me, I'm a totally solar powered light entity. 
I need to eat light every day. I'm very solar oriented. It's why I don't live in upstate New York. I literally transported myself to California because you get a lot more natural sunlight here than you do in the cold frozen, I wanna say wasteland, cold frozen places like upstate New York and uh, definitely not foggy, rainy, dreary, um, you know, Northern California um, up there with the redwood trees. So very, very specifically engineered my life to be able to get an optimal amount of sunlight. So for I, I wanna make a distinction, like I wanna say like for regular people, like you might be fine at like, you know, whatever, getting a tiny amount of sunlight on the weekends, but I'm not that way. I'm like, I need to get full sunlight every day. So, I mean, I don't want to condescend to regular people, but I would say this, like some plants do fine with low sunlight. You can see in my background here, I have this lovely monstera is what it's named, but those are indoor house plants. And actually the story behind these plants, because I rescue plants, someone left them right in the middle of the courtyard here where I live and gave them no water and they were totally getting fried by the sun because these are delicate indoor house plants. And I watched them for a couple of days and those plants were dying. I'm like, no one does anything with those plants. I am bringing them inside. I am commandeering those plants and I'm bringing them inside and I'm nursing them back to health. And that's what I did. So now those plants are nice and healthy. Some plants don't want to be in the middle of the courtyard in the middle of the day, they will die. And some plants like me love being in the middle of the courtyard in the middle of the day. We will not only not die, but we will like rise up in the most glorious way and grow and expand. So yeah, so for me, ideally, I would spend on a sunny day most of my time outside wearing like a tank top and shorts or you know, exposing as much of my skin to the sun as is socially appropriate and possible without endangering myself. And um, that feels totally right to me. And that's in times when I have um, had the opportunity, that's how I engineered my life. So my call for each one of you is to attempt to engineer your life as much as you possibly can, to absorb and expose yourself to as much natural sunlight as you can, even recognizing that it's very difficult because I was feeling sad, like how am I gonna talk to these people and tell them to connect with the real sun when it's so difficult? So just recognizing, okay, there is this fake thing that is just bright and hot in the sky and it's not that positive to be exposed to, but then there's the real sun is up there and out there. So optimally, what you do is sun gazing at sunrise and at sunset. And this can also be very challenging because of the way that architecture is made. Like, where does the sun rise? Is there a building in the way? Is there a bunch of trees in the way? And where does the sun set? Like, do you have a clear line of sight vision? Because initially you're gonna need line of sight. And that means that you're physically in the presence of the sun, you could see it with your eyes. Let me just drink a little bit more. When you get your energy field um, moving faster and grow more optimized energetic anatomy, then you can reach beyond the trees and then you can reach beyond the obstacles. Because like I figured out ways when I lived in Northern California to reach beyond the clouds and to touch the true sun. But in order to do that, I need to have the architecture to do that. So it's just like having muscles. You have to have a certain amount of muscle power to be able to do that. Or another good analogy is like saying, um, if you're starting a small business, you start you're bootstrapping yourself up and initially you don't have very much equipment. So if you have a pie business, you have like one pie pan and a small oven. You like make pie and you sell a pie and you make another pie and you sell it. And you make pies one at a time. Like that's great, but you got to optimize production. And so what you do is you save your money. This is bootstrapping. And then eventually you're able to buy like 10 pie pans. And then eventually you're able to buy a commercial oven. You can cook 10 pies at once. And then you sell 10 pies and you sell 10 pies and you sell more and more and more. And then at a certain point, you know, you save your money, bootstrap, and you're able to afford a whole and giant bakery, whole giant commercial bakery, right? This is what you're doing with your third eye, your tendril of attention, your higher faculties, your light body. You are bootstrapping yourself on up. Oh, you know something? I might need to take care of my dog. Sorry, I've been having tummy troubles. And I think that, let me just press pause. In terms of bootstrapping yourself with your light consumption through your energetic anatomy, what you're starting off with is like higher faculties 
your wheels aren't spinning that fast. Tendril isn't reaching out that strongly. You've got like a little tiny drinking straw, not a big giant fire hose. And what you need to do is begin the process of building your light body. Create a practice where get up every morning when the sun comes up in your area, which again, I know that these can be challenges to be able to engineer the architecture of your day so that you are available to the sun when it is rising and also available when the sun is going down. So right now I'm much more in control of my own schedule, but at other times when I was working for other people as opposed to running my own businesses that, um, yeah, sometimes I had to be working or doing something for someone else and the sun was going down and I was always like, huh? Ah, I wish I was outside sun gazing right now, but I have to be doing emails and staring at this fake blue light of a computer. So um, I, I'm totally sympathetic to those challenges. Whenever possible, engineer your day so that you are able to get up with the sun and sun gaze. And when I say bootstrapping, and then also, also at the end of the day, an ideal day is get up with the sun. I know I just said 10 million fragments. Rain this in, Aurora. Okay. An ideal day is get up with the sun, do your sun gazing. It should be like 10 or 15 minutes or so. And you do it before you put on your glasses, your contact lenses too, even though I know that can be hard because like I can't see anything without my contact lenses, but I try to do that part of my day before I put them in. And then at the end of your day, when the sun is going down and here it's around like six or 7 PM, that's like much more manageable this time of year to be able to do it than when the sun goes down at like four or four 30, if you've got commitments. Um, but um, expose yourself to the sun again, that didn't come out right. Make yourself available to the sun again by sitting in its presence with it directly line of sight, lining up with your forehead. Can't expect yourself in the beginning to first of all, sun gaze in the middle of the day. Second of all, get a fire hose of information all at once, or be able to jump over hurdles to transcend obstacles to be able to get there. That's the whole point. Like when you're a little tiny sprout, that's asking too much of you. When you're a beginner baker, you have one baking pan, you're not ready to fulfill an order for 50 pies. Like you don't have the equipment for that. You got it? You have to build your equipment. And you build your equipment, it's your light body, through accreting light, and light is both energy and chi or prana or life force energy, and it is also ideas, consciousness, and information. And you must build it and then sustain it. Because like, let's say you get a commercial bakery and you're baking all these pies, hundreds of pies a day. If no one's buying your pies, you can't sustain your bakery operation at that level. So when you get up to speed and you're able to do more direct sun gazing and receive so much more ideas and energy, it means you have to sustain it or like whatever, if you're an athlete and build all these muscles and you're like, you have to eat like 5,000 calories a day because you have big giant muscles that take a lot of calories. If you don't eat that much, your muscles go bye-bye because you don't have the energy to sustain your infrastructure. So if you're just starting out, you start out like a little sprout, or if it's been winter time, you have to, to treat yourself as if you're just starting out again. So this is how I kind of feel, even though I live in a very sunny climate, we had a lot of rain and clouds and unusual weather for our area. I was not able to get out as much as I like to in direct sunlight over the winter time. And now it's springtime and the sun is available again or more strong and available. And I feel like I'm starting from the beginning. And you know what else? I feel like, like I'm very pale. Like I look like an uncooked chicken. Like this is what it feels like when you go through times without having enough light. So you have to kind of start off slowly. And as you start off slowly and you, I, when I say expose yourself to the sun, that just has a bad connotation, but you uh, absorb sunlight. And of course it makes physical changes in the color and um, translucency of your skin. Your skin becomes less translucent and melanocytes create and emit melanin, which is also related to your pineal gland, which is light body infrastructure on the physical biological level to make it so that you don't get fried right? So you're coming out of winter. I think everybody can relate unless you live in like Ecuador or someplace where it's, you know, equatorial and you get sunlight all the time. But if you're almost anyplace else in the globe and you're like, okay, um, it's winter time and there's like 
no protection on your torso and on your back from wearing clothes all the time, when you go out in your bathing suit, just go out for like five minutes. Don't fry yourself the first time you go out there and also wear some skin protectant oils. Like coconut oil is great, carrot seed oil is great, natural skin protectants, all right? But how do you bootstrap? Beyond just exposing yourself and your skin to the sun and becoming more tan, what happens is you expose yourself to the consciousness of the sun and your awareness grows and your tendril of attention gets stronger. So initially it's like a tiny little drinking straw and it's kind of wimpy, it's not that strong, but at a certain point it gets fatter and more muscular and it can go off and get, get to the sun much more easily. And you can also ingest more. So instead of having a little trickle of ideas and information coming inside of you, you can have big giant gulps of information coming inside of you. And when that information or light comes inside of you, then you move at a faster rate. You are getting more towards light speed. You can absorb and appreciate more of the direct wisdom of the sun and the stars. And then also you can withstand more of that force of light that is coming inside of you. So you essentially become like a plant that is starting out on a little tiny sprout and can be fried and is delicate and needs um, shade and dappled sunlight. But eventually you become like a big giant sunflower. You can stand there in the full sun and not be fried. And you have all of the solar collectors, all the leaves to be able to make use of all of that sun. So that is bootstrapping. You start off with a minimum of equipment. You sun gaze and eat from the sun. Your equipment grows. The more that your equipment grows, the more that you can eat from the sun. And then at a certain point, you're optimally up to speed where you're eating big giant gulps of energy from the sun. And then in an ideal world, that's what you would do. You would just keep on eating larger and larger meals from the sun and then eventually you would stop eating like the potatoes and apples and avocados and whatever grilled chicken that you get from the, the food room known as the grocery store you would switch over entirely to light that's the goal all right um in order to do so can't take it personally you got to clear out your whole entire environment because there is so much Kaka poo poo doo doo between you and the sun that's making it very difficult for you to receive these ideas and information. So disappointment, Aurora's disappointment because I know that that kaka poo poo doo doo is not supposed to be there. I know the sun is hugely responsible and wants us to connect. I know that the sun is doing its best, but for some unfathomable reason, we're in this situation. And then I'm just going to do the best I possibly can and encourage each one of you to do the best you possibly can as well. So how do you do sun gazing and what is it? So when I get up in the morning, I go out first thing and the sun is just coming up through trees and that's optimum because it's not just that the optical light is filtered. So not all of it is reaching my eyes, but trees act as a consciousness filter. So the sun and the stars are at an exalted level of consciousness and are moving at a very, very fast rate. And you're at a nascent level of consciousness and you're not moving that fast. Trees are faster than you. And they, are, they have developed a beautiful rapport with the sun and the stars. And when you are, the sun is filtering through trees and then coming to you, you're not just filtering through a like you know, a filter that's of optical light, trees contain all of this ancestral information and connection. So trees, first of all, form a network, like an antenna-like network or grid. The news, they carry the news around your whole entire planet and share information with each other and with many other animals in your world. And they also contain the ancestral knowledge of all of these other trees that have been around for an enormously long amount of time. Some trees grow from a seed, some trees grow from cuttings. The giant redwoods of Northern California mostly grow from cuttings and nodes or clones at the trunk, like at the root level. And um, that means that they contain the ancestral information of the other trees from thousands of years ago. So when the sun is here, 
Let's draw it out for you. Let's draw a tree, get a tree color. All right, so here is a tree. I wanna get rid of the doo-doo. Let's just put a tree here. I cannot draw today. That is the most abstract tree. Can we do better? Wait, here's the trunk and here's the canopy. And then here's some roots going down. Okay, pretty good. Uh, when you have light that comes through that tree, what you have is this incredibly strong abstraction that's coming from the real sun. And then it's filtering not just through the leaves of the tree, but through the consciousness presence of all trees and through the ancestral knowledge. And that's so now I'm showing this is kind of like breaking up. I hope you can see that. And then that broken up baby bites comes inside of you. And those baby bites um, circulate throughout your whole entire uh, energy body, your whole entire light body. That's not the end of the journey. You also then broadcast back. Let's just find another color that's not going to be too confusing for this picture here. You also broadcast back your um, digested viewpoint of all of this stuff that has come to you. The idea is that this becomes a circuit. Energy comes from the sun, comes through all these different filters and comes to you, and then you send it back to the sun. That is a healthy system. So you're in a larger system that has not been healthy for a long amount of time, and then that was extra special unhealthy with what's going on in terms of atmospheric pollutions. I talked about EMF and smog and fry, but I didn't speak enough about the particulates, the sky poops, the persistent aerosols, and different glazes that are put in the sky, all of which make it difficult for light to reach you, but also make it difficult for your light to reach the sun. You emanate light and the light that you emanate is more than infrared, which is perceived as heat and is not necessarily optical light. It is the light of your pure consciousness and your awareness. So when I talk about having a rapport with the sun and having a conversation with the sun, you send back your viewpoint and your um, experience, the um, distillation of all that you've been through up into that moment and your present state of light. Hold on, the lighting is weird. Let me just turn on an auxiliary light. So once again, when you send back your light of awareness to the sun and to the entire star system, what you're sending back is everything you've experienced since the moment of birth or entry into this world along with your present levels of either exaltation or difficulties. And that's also how you can really know that the sun is not some distant, uncaring, you know, thing in the sky that's like, coil up your own electrical cord, I don't care about you. No, not at all. If you have this effective connection, it's like calling home and you're like, this is what's going on with me. Yeah, a bunch of bad stuff happened and now I got a lot of like, <laughs> S-H-I-T happening all around me. And the sun is supposed to get that call. I'm just like, OMG, I got to do something for you because I am not a cold, distant, uncaring um, stupidity. I'm a very wise, very attentive, very involved parent that is here for you. So that's very, very big. Perhaps you have felt isolated or ejected in some way, like, Get out, you know what I mean? Like the ejection from the Garden of Eden type of feeling. And that's, I hope you haven't internalized that because that's all very untruthful. I think the sun and the stars are making their greatest efforts to be able to reconnect with you and care for you in the most you know, effective way that they can. And that there's a lot of technological interferences. And the technological interferences are not something that's like small and, um, optional. They're like, no, I don't think that I'll take those interferences today. I'm living a different type of life. Like they're affecting everyone. Spray that's in the air, pollutants in food and water, frequency um, brigades, I didn't have the word for it, frequency um, encapsulations and fibrous growths inside of the body. The answer is like, no one here really gets an opportunity to just simply say no thank you to any of those things. Like, I'm not interested in participating in any of those pollutions. Go pollute someone else. Everybody here is dealing with it. It's kind of a level playing field. 
Everybody here is dealing with it. And I am, again, a very, very good hurdle jumper. I'm having difficulty dealing with it. So I just want you to know that's how <laughs> difficult or egregious um, the situation is. So how do I do my sun gazing? I get up in the morning when the sun is out and go outside in my bathroom and my neighbors see me if they're awake. And I don't have my eyeglasses on, I can't see anything, but I can see the sun. And what I do is I send out my tendril of attention to the sun. I envision that I have a very, very, very long, like an elephant's trunk that reaches out and touches on the sun. It's my tendril of attention. I pay attention to the sun. In terms of the anatomy of my skull, it is absolutely essential for me to have my eyes and my nose and my upper palate and even the area at the very top of my, my um, where my spine meets my skull, the very top of my neck, like inside of my brain and skeletal system, all of that I aim at the sun, all of that. So my tongue goes on the roof of my mouth, my nose, my sinuses, my eyes, my forehead, and that thing that's at the top of my spine all point to the sun. It's a very active feeling. Like if you couldn't envision like every fiber of your being, every hair on the outside of your being is like pointing at the sun. And then what I do is I drink it in. So it is an act of willpower to say, I want this energy to flow into me. And I breathe it in, breathe it in up through my sinuses, but not just sinuses that are here, inward through the bridge of my nose, into the sinuses that are up above my eyebrows. And then I swallow it down. And I breathe it and I swallow it down all the way down into, I will tilt my camera. This is my belly down here. So beginning with the area that's my lower abdomen and successive breaths, bringing it into my body more and more until I feel it rising upward through my chest cavity until at a certain point, and this can take a few moments or longer depending upon what the pace of the day is like, but at a certain point, I feel it come inside of me and my head spontaneously tilts upward like the way of the face of a sunflower follows the sun, my head tilts upward, my chin tilts up like this. And when that happens, I feel all of these chakras, the sunlight goes doon, 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 all the way through to my pelvis, then reaches up all the way through my pelvis again, up to the top of my head. And I call this an alley-oop. In basketball, American basketball, you got like the ball is dribbling, 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 dribbling. And then they kind of like make their ascent to the basket, run, run, run. And they jump up and they scoop and they alley-oop and stick it into the basket. That is the best description I have for it because the energy comes upward through your pelvis, through your spine, up through your neck, up out the top of your head, and then kind of like boop to the sun, alley-oop, alley-oop. So this and that's a full complete circuit. And when that happens, you've received energy from the sun and the sun received energy from you. And I forgot to mention that you've also got a connection to the planet where either I'm sitting with my butt on the ground, but sometimes it's like cold or uncomfortable. So you don't have to do that, but you can sit in a lawn chair. You can put your feet on the ground. But the imp imp important part is that you are drawing energy upward through your feet or your connection to the planet, it's from the material. You are creating a bridge between yourself as a materialized object that is slowed down light and the purely ephemeral nature of pure consciousness and optical light and pure energy. You make yourself a bridge between the earth and the sky. So energy comes to you from the sun. Energy also is drawn upward from the realm of matter and you then project that mixture back to the sun and the sun receives it. And it's like, thank you for sharing your feedback and the truthfulness of your journey and where who you are in this moment with me. And it's totally loving and accepting of everything that you've said, the good, the bad, and the ugly. It's totally appropriate. If you're about to hit a brick wall, totally appropriate for the sun to know that 
or if you're struggling financially, or if you have health issues, or if you have a planet that is invaded by stuff, or if you are facing any other difficulties, the sun needs to know about it. And then the response of the sun is to send out a recalibrated, upgraded and augmented timeline that you then get to experience because the sun now knows like, oh, you've got this, this and this going wrong. I better fix this. And the more of us that do this, of course, like the more that reality becomes fine tuned, this should actually be the most normal thing for every single person. There's huge infrastructure and agenda against it because it is so empowering. So this is also when I sun gaze, I get my assignments for the day. That can be anything from like working on an art project or doing a particular recording or doing whatever is the thing I need to do in my day. My assignments aren't arbitrary. and They don't come from like the government or whatever, any externalized authority figure like that. It comes from my direct connection to the sun. And I just know what I need to be doing. And in that sense, like I keep doing what I need to be doing, even when I haven't had the solar connection. It's a little bit like flying blind, but I'm like, okay, like I kind of still know what I need to do, even though I haven't um, uh, tuned in very effectively. Um, but that's what you're supposed to do. Receive your directives for the day. And that's when your son gives up that. When you sunrise, sun gaze. And then when you sunset, sun gaze, optimally, this is what you do. Like, so for me, I make a lot of music, right? So during my day, I'm like making a music, making a song, editing it, doing a bunch of other stuff. And then when the sun is going down, ideally you have like a chair and a window and you can just sit comfortably. And uh, sometimes like it's not perfect. So I'm kind of like craning my head like this so that the sun will go into my eyes. It doesn't matter. Do, do the best you can, do, even if it, you look silly. Um, but uh, I put on the song that I've been working on for the day and I listen to my song and I send that energy back to the sun, kind of like saying like, okay, here's what I did today. And the sun receives it and then gives me my next codes or directives or augmentations that I need in order to keep going. And that is literally how you have a healthy light body. And your light body is more than an abstraction that is just timelines, possibilities, and probabilities. It also relates on a cellular level to certain levels of your metabolism and body architecture. So in your physical body, pineal gland is part of light body, skin and melanocytes, melanin producers, part of light body, mitochondria and um, uh, melatonin, are part of your light body. And also digestion, glucose, and electron transport chain, which also happens at the membrane of the mitochondria, part of your light body. So when I ingest light from the sun as non-optical light, and it's coming inward towards you know, my inner eye, it doesn't only illuminate my mind or my brain or my retinas or my inner eye. It circulates through my whole entire body. So I've already shown you a lot of imagery from my artwork about how you have these chakras that are like interpenetrating wheels. That is part of your circulatory system of light. But I also, when I sun gaze, I feel light going through my digestive tract. I feel light going subcutaneously through the fats underneath my skin. I feel light being exuded from the sebaceous glands, which are the oil producing glands that are in your skin. And again, every single hair that's on the outside of my skin is an antenna that points to the sun. So the sebaceous glands that coat those hairs and the hairs themselves, these are all antennas for tuning into the sun. You can imagine I had a million fingers and they were all hairs on the outside of me and they're all pointing at and tuning into the sun. Um, so that's why I mentioned the skin protectant oils and um, oils on your skin in general are very essential for you to use. I don't use anything that's like, you know, sodium lauryl sulfate or any of these parabens or any of these petroleum prep oil. It's like, you don't want to put that stuff into your sebaceous glands. So also in your diet, you must eat pure oils in your diet. So you stay away from the seed oils that are cheap and industrially produced like canola oil. And you go for either animal um, fats and stuff like that, or the um, oils like olive oil, coconut oil, and um, maybe avocado oil. And why is that? This is not just like some kind of an affluent, affluenza 
I was like, are those potatoes fried in avocado oil? Otherwise I won't eat them. It's not like that. There's a very real reason why you don't want the regular cheap industrially created canola oil because that stuff is an impediment to the circulation of energy through your body. It clogs stuff up. It is not mm, accessible and easy to eat. Butter is good stuff. Butter is good, margarine is bad. Natural stuff is good. Um, uh, industrially created pollutions are bad. And when you eat the right balance of fats in your diet, the, the oils that come out of your sebaceous glands are healthy and holy oils. So another thing that might sound a little strange, but is something just to consider, like I don't wash my body with regular soap that strips away all of those natural oils. I use this stuff called non-soap. That is just like a very, very gentle cleanser. And I even use that for like washing my hands during the day. Cause what I wanna do is cultivate my healthy skin oils, which are sacred secretions of the body. It's a different way of looking at the body cause mostly you're told like your body is dirty and greasy and skin oils are gross and you have to use ivory soap and <laughs> strip your body of all possible oils. And you know, like that's cleanliness. And I'm like, that's not what you want to do to your body. Even though I'm a physical newcomer, I have learned the optimum ways of cultivating the body. So you want to cultivate healthy sebaceous gland secretions and definitely on your scalp too. The hair oils that come out of your scalp are actually really holy. Everyone's like dirty, greasy hair. It's bad and wrong. And I'm like, holy oils, coat your body. Um, so just trying to like re acculturate you to your own body and what this is supposed to be like. So um, getting into the sun, like if, you know, I recognize like sometimes I work in the regular world. Sometimes also I make, I didn't, I didn't finish that sentence. I recognize how difficult it can be to cover yourself in um, fragrant essential oils and stand in the sunlight at dawn um, when you might also have commitments that are work commitments and you cannot necessarily arrive like all like, you know, shiny grease stuff and smelling like weird things. But even more so, what I wanted to say is I also, I make my own oils that contain cannabis extracts that are doubly socially inappropriate to wear arriving at work smelling like certain substances. But that is actually one of the best things you can put on your body topically. So actually, and there are plenty of CBD products too that are pure CBD, totally legal in all the United States and nothing that would be um, incapacitating to you to be able to do your daily activities. Um, but yeah, putting on topical cannabinoids in your, um, in your skin helps you to connect with the sun. It helps to capacitate you. And I can go on a big biblical trip, even though I'm not a biblical literalist, but there's some really interesting stuff in the book of Exodus, the holy anointing oil. The holy anointing oil recipe is in there. It's basically olive oil and a lot of the flowering tops of the cannabis plant, which has been etym etymologically shown to be a reference to the cannabis plant, which was in use uh, 2,000 years ago, even 3,000 years ago, especially the sect of Therapeutiae, healers of Alexandria, Egypt, who used it extensively, both internally and as a topical. So it was known in the Middle East and it was used as part of their uh, repertoire of healing oils and uh, is what the word Messiah means, anointed with the holy oil. That's the holy oil. That's what you wanna put on your body. And then when you do that, and you get into the sun, essentially what you're doing is amplifying and making your signal louder. You're making it so that you can hear the sun more effectively and the sun can hear you effectively. So optimize your day. Ideally, get up at dawn, cover yourself in holy oils, expose yourself to the sun, receive all of your directives, and then do your day. And then at the end of your day, you sit down and you sun gaze and you give back all of the energy and ideas that you've experienced and ex the results of your collaboration with the sun. That's really the best way. It's not a parent-child dynamic. It is really a collaboration between two equals. And when I go into that modality, then I'm less disappointed. Instead of being like the sun, like you're supposed to be perfect. You're the big, you know, giant parent and I'm just a little tiny child. And why did you let bad things happen? Instead of being that way, 
and you look at it like equals and you're both coworkers working at the same reality factory, then you talk to it and you say like, hey, the world is effed up, blah, 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 it needs to change. And the sun is like, thank you very much, clipboard, check, 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 change, blah, blah, blah. And then you receive that back. That's, I think, a lot more of a healthy structure and dynamic to expect in terms of connecting to the sun and also to the stars to a lesser extent. Very focused on the sun because it's our nearest broadcaster of consciousness, but the entire stellar network is connected. So the things that your sun in your solar system says to you and broadcasts to you doesn't just come from this sun. It actually comes from the galactic center and it actually comes from and interrelates to all of the things, thought structures that all of these um, suns and stars in the sky are doing. Okay, so I wait, there's questions, but I also want to talk about the galactic center and I want to talk about what is a black hole because a black hole is what happens in this world of mortality when a star dies. And in the world of science, you look at a person who is dead and you poke the corpse with a stick. And you're like, that guy ain't moving anymore. He's bye-bye, he's kaput. And science doesn't look at it like, oh, like that consciousness went through a doorway and now it is on its journey going elsewhere. That is usually held at, reserved for uh, people that have more of a spiritual inclination, right? Science is kind of like consciousness arises as a phenomenon of the brain. And when the brain is bye-bye, consciousness is bye-bye. This is scientist's reductionist way of doing it. But all of that in order to say that when you look at the journey of consciousness, that is a star in its evolution, when it dies, it doesn't go bye-bye, but it evolves to its next state of being, which is a black hole. So stars are born. How are stars born? Mommy, daddy, where do star, baby come, star babies come from? Well, sit down and I'll tell you the story. It doesn't involve sex, but it involves cymatics. So stars come about into existence because there are giant, it's called a planetary nebula. Uh, there are many of them in the world. These are potentials for stars. And it's a nebula that contains a lot of plasmas and hot gases and um, tiny specks of space dust, all in a very disorganized way. And in order to create the miraculous um, container for consciousness known as a star, you have to organize that matter in just the right way. And the way that that happens is through cymatics, which is if you've ever seen um, a plate that has like fine sprinkling of sand or talcum powder on it, and then you vibrate it with like a violin bow or playing some music at it, the plate vibrates and it organizes the tiny particles into these incredibly beautiful complex patterns, cymatics. So you can do some research, you can look at some videos about that. It's very satisfying to know that that happens. This happens on a galactic scale, big giant galactic scale waves of consciousness are moving through the vastness of space. And when they move through these planetary nebula, they set up patterns that begin to cause the entire thing to organize and self-organize into these complexities that have coherence, just like your body has coherence. And when you do it just right, you get enough mass and enough coherence together to be able to not only create the cascade of chemical reactions and, um, atomic nuclear miracles, but you also get a bodily physical container for consciousness. It's exactly analogous to the moment of conception when your mommy and your daddy made a baby that ended up being you in the mammalian world, or when sperm meets egg in any of the other like insectoid or um, fish, reptilian, amphibian worlds. It's the moment of genesis. So a star is born in a very similar way, the moment of genesis, except instead of um, you know, biological material from the father and the mother coming together, it's planetary nebulae that are organized by larger um, musical waveforms into a biological presence. But you're, I mean, you're more than just like, yes, a meat suit that was created from the confluence of genetic materials from your parents your consciousness. You're like, I'm alive. I'm a person. I'm a person. The sun is a person also. The sun and all of each one of the stars are people. They have personhood, characteristics, uniquenesses, agenda, motivations, things that they need to learn. They are exactly like you, but they are very massive and they live on a grand scale. 
you're like a fruit fly. So like for, to us, we live a hundred years, a fruit fly lives like three days. When I throw away some banana peels in my garbage can, and then the next morning I open up the garbage can to like throw away the coffee grinds and start a fresh cup of coffee. And all these fruit flies come out and they're like, I've never seen the outside of the can before. There's a whole world out here. They're flying all around me in the kitchen. And um, that's because they are only gonna live for like two more days. But that moment of the garbage can lid opening is their moment of like, dun, dun, boom, boom, boom. We've now exited the garbage can. We're exploring, you know, the, the kitchen realm. That's just like you guys getting off of the surface of your planet. So um, <laughs> it's hard to talk to a fruit fly because they only exist for a couple of days. And so while you went to bed and you snoozed for one, one night, that was like a third of their life. And they're, they built a whole civilization, your garbage can before you woke up in the morning. It can be very, very difficult to have a real-time rapport and come to a caring relationship with organisms that happen on a vastly different time scale than you. This has been largely the impediment to humanity connecting with the sun and the stars as real friends and as real allies. As the sun and the stars, again, they can live for billions of years. There are some stars that have lived for so long. So universe means one story of universe, one story of timeline architecture, as opposed to the cosmic fabric, which contains totality, all right? So this universe is about 13 billion years old and is roughly considered middle-aged and that there will be another roughly like 13 to 18 billion years left. Miles on the chassis, all right? For you to be able to reach uh, the entropic heat death of this universe. Some stars are so long lived that they were born in the beginning of this timeline universe and they have not died yet. And they probably will not die before the end, the entropic heat death or the end of everything in this particular linear narrative story. That's pretty extraordinary. It's a lifespan that is so long, like you're not even a fruit fly, <laughs> like the tiniest flash, the tiniest little fast flash almost incomprehensible for you to even think that there are organisms that live that long, much less have a conversation with them, much less like have them care about your life and you care about their life. And then there are some stars that, so those are stars that are extremely stable that can live for billions of years at that level. There are some stars that are not as stable. And when I talk about stable, what I mean is you have to have a balance of forces between the emissions of the star kind of spewing outward and the crushing gravity of being such a massive object. And in order to be alive, the star needs to balance those two forces in homeostasis. Just like you and I, for you and I to be alive, we got to balance two things, food and water in and food and water out. <laughs> and if you have not enough food and water going in, but a lot of energy and food and water going out, then you die. And if you have the opposite, uh, you know, too, too much, not enough going in, too much going out, you die. And also if you have too much going in and not enough going out, you die also. You have to be in a state of balance between what you are ingesting and what you are emitting or excreting. And so stars die when they can no longer maintain that balance of inward crushing forces and outward expansive forces. And then what the star does, I call it back flipping into itself from a spherical direction. Every single direction of the star internalizes, back flips into itself and it crushes inward. And that is when you get my customary drawing of the infinitely stretched fabric of the super stretched fabric of consciousness, space-time consciousness, let's draw it. This is my customary drawing if we've got I draw it as a plane, but please recognize that it is actually spherical. So here's a plane like this with checkerboard pattern on it. And here is a star that is dying and crushing inward on itself. And what it does is it makes the inward journey and makes this fabric bend into a vortex shape. And that vortex just keeps going. It goes all the way off the screen, all the way down here to infinity. But what I drew is a little plane, but it's not a plane. It's actually a sphere like this. And it crushes inward from 
every direction, every direction, every direction, every direction. But those diagrams are very, very hard for me to draw. So I draw them as if they are a plane, but not a sphere. But be smart and know that it's a sphere. So this is a black hole. Black hole is the infinite stretching of the fabric of reality to the point of singularity, which is the zeroth dimension, which is infinity. And so when we say that the star dies, it is not the conventional description of something from um, human science in this world where it's like, oh, the star just died and it went bye-bye. It evolves. And I like that a lot better. I watched a couple of videos that were about stars and their lifespan and to the evolution of a star. I'm like, I'm stealing that. I like that a lot better because it's not the death of a star. It is the evolution of a star into the next level of what it is into the next chapter of its existence. So it actually doesn't become a non-existent thing. It becomes a black hole. And in your galaxy, so your galaxy is an enormous cluster of an almost uncountable number of stars. And at the center of your galaxy, there is something called a supermassive black hole. So all the mass of the star, when it backflips into itself and dives inward endlessly, gets crushed together becomes super dense and it doesn't stop being dense. It gets even denser and denser and denser and denser and denser, super dense concentration of mass. And that's why it is super gravitational. A whole lot of gravity packed into a very, very small amount of space. A super massive black hole is what happens when really, 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 really big things crush into themselves and get really, 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 really condensed and super dense. And that is what you have at the center of this galaxy that is the ultimate conductor. Tap, tap, tap. Ah, galactic conductor. And I not only conduct like your flutes and your tubas on earth, I conduct the guy who conducts all of you guys. I conduct the stars that make the biological organisms. So that is the ultimate in terms of like the organizational principle of life in the world. You need to break away from the traditionalist scientific viewpoint of death and what happens when a star becomes a black hole because it's not like some dead ghost, like as for the dead stars flying around wearing a white sheet and somehow um, influencing the life of the living. No, and it's not the pooties either, which are negative dwellers of the membrane of death. The peanut gallery, those who, they got a lot of opinions, but they do not contribute to life. They are not conductors in any way contrast, the supermassive black hole has achieved a level of wisdom and greatness and is part of a overarching continuum of consciousness and exalted viewpoint that gives it the, has earned its position, gives it the power to be able to orchestrate all of these stars. Every single galaxy has as its center a supermassive black hole that is a super gravitational object that holds all of the other stars in place around it. If that super gravitational object were not there as a centralization and a focal point and an organizational feature, all of those stars would drift off elsewhere and everyone would go willy nilly and higgledy piggledy all over the place. But they don't. They stay in um, relatively well-organized superstructures called galaxies. And that is due to the presence, the organizational presence of the conductor that is at the center of the galaxy, which is a supermassive black hole, which is something big that died, but it's not dead in an evil way. It's not dead in a didn't do its math homework correctly type of way. It's not dead in an exploitive way. It has evolved into the next level of what its consciousness is, that then it is empowered to um, direct and control life but I don't want you to go through anthropocentric gyrations when you're like, huh, so like dead people are controlling the lives of the living? Like that's pooty stuff. I don't want you to go into that. But I also want you to recognize that in this world of realm of mortality where even stars can die, that sometimes a star that is heading towards the membrane of death has made erroneous calculations. Sometimes when it dies and it becomes a supermassive black hole, it's doing exactly what it needs to do and then has this, um, uh, organizational effect on all these other lives around it, that cluster around it, that it achieves a greater level of wisdom. Because here's how energy comes to you directly. 
from divine source, which is also the destination of consciousness, the zeroth dimension, through the supermassive black hole at the center of your galaxy, then radiating outward to each of the individuated stars, each of which is like an individual expert musician, which is own with its own characteristics and tone and viewpoint that is valid. And then from each one of those stars beaming through optical light to you. So when light comes to this star, that's your solar system star here, it comes not through linear a point A to point B travels, which would take so long that it would make the light irrelevant, but through hyperspace, the bending and folding through the fabric of time space where point A and point B actually touch so that the light comes from the galactic center and comes to the star fast, instantaneous. But then once the light comes to the star that is here in your solar system, that star is like a portal, a doorway, an aperture through which that pure consciousness emerges into your world of physical matter. And then it travels from point A to point B, from the sun in the sky to your planet in a journey at the speed of light that takes roughly eight minutes. Okay. So most of that journey takes place in hyperspace then it takes place in linear space to be able to get to you. If we go by the traditional model, taking path of light class, like I'm sure it'll just confuse the SHIT out of you, <laughs> but no, it will uplift you into a different perspective because when you have that perspective, you are light and there's no distance between yourself and any other form of light. But for right now, you're getting up to light speed. So there is distance between yourself and the sun and it takes eight minutes for light to emerge from the sun and actually reach the surface of the planet. Okay, so to be less convoluted in my explanation, all of the light that you're receiving here right now is consciousness and directives about time that come from the supermassive black hole, which is a center of wisdom in your galaxy that holds everything together like galaxy glue and then is emitted out to each individual star and then from each individual star is broadcast as optical light. So your sun star is close to you, it takes eight minutes for the light to reach you. But other stars are far away. They could be billions and billions of, it's called light years. How far can light travel in a year? And that is how far away that uh, those stars are from you. And so that means now you're getting timey-wimey when a very, very distant star emits some optical light that needs to go from point A to point B, this can take millions of years. And by the time it reaches your eye or a telescope here on your planet, it was actually emitted by a sun star. That's millions of years ago. You're getting the news report from millions of years ago. And this guy over here can actually be dead. This is like a dead star. He's dead. But he emitted a bunch of light that's just now getting to your planet. You're just now getting the news, but the guy that wrote the newspaper is dead at this point because that is how long it takes for optical light to travel. But you are nonetheless affected by the emanations and the exudations of the other stars other than your nearest star, which is the sun. Hold on, I need more water. Hold on, thank you for your patience. So you're the most strongly influenced by your nearest sun star that is giving you the strongest or loudest music or loudest directive about what you need to do in each moment. But all the stars have an impact on your consciousness. All the stars have an impact on your trajectory through time. And that is the truth of astrology, not astronomy, but astrology. But then there's a huge amount of anthropocentric interpretive baggage that is placed on top of astrology. But the basic premise is valid that it, throughout your life, and especially at the cr critical moments of like your birth, your death, and other life experiences throughout your 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 existence, that um, there's certain like um, influencers, certain stars and planets that are influencing you based upon their emanations and positions around your existence. So that is truthful. Um, but now let's talk about planets. So stars are virtuosos. Even though I've told you about my disappointments and reserves, reservations about what is happening with stars and their um, you know, inactivity in the face of huge cosmic crimes, planets are different. Stars should direct your 
life experience, stars emanate timelines. Stars and a star has emanated you as a biological being. But planets don't do that type of stuff. Planets are the paintings or the art projects of stars. So if I'm a star, that painting is my planet. It's something that I made. But I don't want you to go to that planet and have it run your planet because that planet does not know everything. That planet is my, I'm talking as a star now, biological art project that I use to be able to learn about and express myself as the biological organisms there are learning and expressing themselves, moving in greater levels of social dynamism and evolving. So you're, what are you doing here in the physical world? You're borrowing a bunch of light from the sun and the stars, you're condensing it as matter, matter. And then what are you doing? Just like nothing, no, you're doing something. You're learning, you're growing, getting wiser. It's called accreting light. And this process takes a long time and you're not perfect. So you guys are still in the process of getting your SHIT together, right? Every planet is that way. Every planet that is created by suns and stars that contains life or the potentials for life, that life is not perfect. It's in the process of self-exploration. It's in the process of wisdom accrual. It's in the process of refinement towards the level of being an eternal being, which is a huge attainment. So if you have planetary beings, and if those beings are using technology to amplify their minds or travel beyond the confines of their planet prematurely, and they are influencing you, that is not right because they don't have their SHIT together. And you don't have your SHIT together because they're two groups of people who don't know what is going on, but who are influencing each other or being influenced by the, the life trajectory of one another. That's not appropriate. They are not virtuosos. They are not in the position and they don't have enough wisdom and perspective to be able to create life, much less control or direct someone else's life. So in my analogy, they would not be like parents or someone who is a guardian over you. They would just be other kids on the playground. You get it? Now I'm hopefully effectively characterizing the other species and star races, especially the technology using ones that are impacting your planet. They don't have wisdom, but they do have technology and they're using it to influence you and even to exploit you. Sometimes they are just slightly older kids on the playground and you might look up to them and think that they are much, much more than you, but they are not the sun. They're not the stars. They're not the presence at the center of the galactic black hole. They're not the source of consciousness. And sometimes they even intentionally bully or exploit lower organisms. And they say like, I'm the star. You better listen to me. They're not, they're not. And you have to develop the inner architecture of discernment to be able to know who they are and what is even going on. So I want to I want to talk about that. I have my notes. I want to make sure to get to everything if I sound breathless, walking on my treadmill here. Um, okay, um, I got that, 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 and that. I got that. I got that. I got that. Got that. I got that. Oh yeah. Uh, okay, I have to talk about. I have to rant against my new age shadow work. So my beautiful lesson from 10 years ago, I talk about the very, very real nature of light coalescing into matter. That, let's draw it. It's art class now, art class. So in art class, you have a light source. Here's a light source emitting some light. Is there supposed to be rays? It could be a light bulb, sun, anything, all right? And then here is an object. We're gonna make this like an apple or something like that sitting on a table. And the light, so one of the most amazing things to think about in terms of light, if you ever have insomnia or just wanna sit staring upward at the sky and think about something really, really cool, if light doesn't hit an object, it just continues onward infinitely. This is a light wave here, very poorly drawn light wave that didn't hit any objects and it just keeps going. It's going to go all the way off the side of your screen infinitely. Then we're going to put the little infinity sign over here. Infinity. If light doesn't interact with an object, 
it simply travels infinitely. God, just really think about that. That's amazing. When light interacts with a physical object, it can do a bunch of different things. It can either bounce off of that object, oh, I bounced off. It can be absorbed by that object, or it can somewhat travel through that object and then come out a little bit diminished or changed in its trajectory or speed out the other side, right? The object itself can be considered solidified light. This object over here is literally what happens when light gets slowed down. So when you have this apple sitting on your table here in art class, what you have is a bunch of light that has been slowed down and did not go on its endless journey of in infinite trajectory. It stayed here in the form of uh, an apple. And then what that means is you've got an area of implication that I'm going to draw as a shadow. Wait, let me draw this better. That would be the area of implication over here. If I just color this effectively, I can't I work with this pen, but this is a table. And so then you can see, I didn't really do it that well. But if you do it right, shadows make an object sit down. This is art school. You're drawing a still life. You don't want that apple to just be floating in nothingness. You want it to look like an apple that has form and it sits on a table. And when you put in this shadow over here, again, you do it right. It kind of works a little bit better. It makes it look like it's sitting on a surface. And in the physical world that I'm using as an allegory, to speak allegorically about consciousness, that is valid and that is apt. The coalescence of light in this object over here means there is an implied necessary shadow realm in this area over here, the place where light is not. Concentration of light here stopped on its journey means implied area. Oops, what the heck just happened? I don't know. I got to jump out of here and come back. Oh my God. Okay. Implied area of no light over here. This original teaching from 10 years ago is so pristine, so naive, so like just very, it's like, isn't that adorable? It's so adorable that I taught that to everyone. And it is, I condescend to myself because it's very truthful. But this whole thing got all blown out of proportion. Misinterpret is ripe for misinterpretation in terms of how humans on an anthropocentric level are interpreting shadow work. Because this area over here can be interpreted as an area of darkness where light does not exist. It is an area of ignorance. It is an area that is implied by the creation of matter that a shadow is going to be created. The positive of an object it then creates the negative of a shadow. And that this has then been used as an anthropocentric template for behavioralism and characteristics in order to say that if this pink ball represents like positive characteristics, like hugging people, growing gardens, you know, like whatever, brushing your dog's hair, then the negative personality characteristics are um, made as an unintended consequence of that, like flaying puppies alive and, you know, boiling people in oil and horrible atrocities. That's not true. None of that is 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 true. Okay. The flaw of new age shadow work, or I should say, instead of being also down on the new age, reductionist, simplified, erroneous shadow work that says, because I exist and I'm doing nice things for puppies, something else exists that's doing evil things against puppies. No, that is not truthful. You can actually have a very, very wonderfully created, wonderfully architected cosmic infrastructure where you just simply do nice things for puppies and that there are no horrible monsters that are doing bad things to puppies anyway. That is not required for some level of balance. And the things that are psychopathological that do bad things to puppies or create harm in any way are actually not a necessary but unintended consequence of all the goodness in the world. 
That is not truthful. And in the realm that you presently inhabit, where I'm an art teacher and I'm teaching you about like, here is your light source, here is your object, and then here is your shadow over here. That's in order to build a believable view of physical reality. Like these are part of the tips of the trade of how you paint and draw on a flat surface, but make it look like it's volumetric. But this is not a direct analogy into the necessity of good and evil in upholding the architecture of reality. The sun doesn't have a shadow. The sun is a giant plasma ball in the sky and it does not have a shadow. It doesn't have an antithesis. There's not an anti-sun. There's not like the sun, it's all about good stuff and make you feel all nice and fantastic. And then like the anti-sun that is about like, you know, whatever, making you feel bad and killing you. No, that actually doesn't exist. Nor are there personality characteristics, nor is there like, where's the shadow of the sun? It's nowhere, there's no table. Do you get it? Like the sun is not an apple sitting on a table. The sun is a plasma beam that is floating in you know, a context doesn't have a shadow in your realm on the physical planet Earth. If you ever have looked at a candle that is burning and shine a light on it and see the shadow, the candle wax casts a shadow, the wick casts a shadow, the candle's flame does not cast a shadow. A candle's flame is plasma. It does not have a shadow. There's not an antithesis to it. It simply is light. So this is a perfect example of how when people start to awaken their higher faculties and they're looking through their eye of insight, through their anthropocentric filter, decoder ring to comprehend reality. And they think, oh, this, everything has a shadow. It's balanced and there's yin and there's yang and this is the bad stuff bounces out the good stuff. That's not true. It's totally erroneous. And some people have used that in order to justify or make sense of atrocities. Hold on, we got bribe cheeky. You do not have a shadow that is the necessary antithesis of your personality when you are a pure light being. The sun has a personality. The stars all have personalities. They are relentlessly positive. They are nourishing and life-giving. They are light, they are energy, they are awareness, they are organizational presence and intelligence. That is, they are the embodiment and epitome of divine intelligence. That is what light is. And it is hugely erroneous to presume that, oh, so there's a big giant radiating source of light and intelligence in the sky. And then there's also gotta be like a giant pile of doo-doo. That's the antithesis, no. There does not have to be the giant pile of doo-doo that is either darkness, pathology, evil, ignorance, or chaos, or lack of organization. That is not a necessary aspect of the infrastructure of reality. I am here to tell you this. So it's a very, very flawed philosophy and worldview to go through the world and to say you must do, quote, quote unquote, do your shadow work, which is anytime you feel a negative, emotional response to something to presume that there is some area of uh, negative ignorance that you must heal and rectify and explore. There's just, it's so, it's so wrong. I have to rant, I have to rant against it, but my fire is just not here right now. You know, like I'm not feeling that passionate in my rant. I should be like, you know, railing against it, but I'm just like, no, wah, wah. like that is just very, very erroneous, but dangerous, which is why I have to speak about this. And it, it also to defend my work in the consideration that I have somehow influenced human thought patterns that are misinterpreting what I'm sharing or coming through a completely distorted filter and creating a presumption that somehow darkness and pathology are a part of you and are necessary for your growth. That's wrong. That's not truthful. In fact, darkness and pathology prevent you from growing. They are part of the um, static on the line or nonsense signals, nonsensical signals that exist that make it more difficult for you to learn. So they are not educational. They are not didactic. They're actually making it much harder for you to learn and, and make sense of the world 
through your experience of journeying here. And I can comprehend why people are so, they, they are not able to make sense of or comprehend why bad things happen. You're struggling to make sense of a world that doesn't make sense because there's a lot of erroneous signals. There are a lot of erroneous signals and a lot of non truthful things that are asserted here. And then when you look around, you're like, there's a lot of untruthful things. I guess that's all stuff that's supposed to be here that I'm supposed to learn from. No, actually what happened was somebody went into the cosmic library and put a bunch of nonsense in there that you have nothing to learn from it. And that's a very, very difficult lesson to internalize because everybody's on a quest for meaning. And so they're like, oh, it's got to mean something. And if I come here and I say, yeah, it's just a crap and it means nothing. Then you're like, oh, you make this face like, no, like, no, it's got to mean something like all that pain, all that suffering, all that stuff. It's got to be here to teach me something. I'm like, no, it's not here to teach you anything. Making that Kermit face. No, it's not here to teach you anything. It's not supposed to exist. It's not necessary. And it's not didactic. And it's not the same as the shadow that I draw in art school. Here's me in art school, putting a little shadow underneath an apple to make it appear in the illusion of two-dimensional drawing as if it's a three-dimensional form. The shadow does not help you in your anthropocentric quest for meaning to create a structure of reality. In fact, it is you're in a confusion and the presumption of the necessity of shadow, darkness, or pathology means that you're just making up stories and narratives to try to justify or comprehend why something is. So, there is a difference between pathology and sacred ignorance. Sacred ignorance is all the stuff that you don't know about yet. So if you're in a room and areas of it are illuminated and those areas are the real you, but then you have other areas of the room where simply they're not illuminated yet. They're also you, they're not bad, wrong or evil. They are healthy and good. You simply haven't learned about them yet. That is totally, totally, totally different than pathology, which are things that should never exist and should never happen and are truly not parts of your own nature. They are not parts of your own personality structure. So one thing that is truthful between yourselves as physical outgrowths of the sun and the sun and the stars themselves, everybody is here on a journey of learning who you are and who you're not in terms of characteristics. So the sun and the stars are a giant neurology of a much, much larger consciousness presence that is similarly to you as an individual on a journey of learning who it is and who it's not. And that is expressed in your, your life experience and the expressions of the sun and the stars in their biological experiments on planets, who you are and who you're not. But there's a very, very real answer as to who you are and who you're not. It's not random and arbitrary. Like my face is made of purple cupcakes and a, you know, a Pegasus flies by in the background. It's like fantasy. It's not just random or self-serving. There's a very, very real like answer to the math question of who you are or a very, very real way to tune your instrument so that you fit into the symphony of life in the cosmic architecture. It's not just, I choose, I'm this. <laughs> I just choose to say I'm this and that's who I am. Like it's not, that is very simplistic and reductionist. So there's a genuine recipe of who you are that is based in your eternal truthful self. And this is the same as the sun and the stars who also have a true recipe of who they are, which includes their creation, generation and sustenance of you and that these are not random or arbitrary, and that there are some things that are not you, and there are some events and personality characteristics that are not you, and that you are not required to internalize them. So what I was trying to teach about from 10 years ago, I feel has done you a disservice through mm, constant targeted manipulation and misrepresentation of truthfulness into something that then just puts you into greater levels of confusion. And you're already in levels of confusion because you're like, why does all this doo-doo exist? Why is all this bad stuff here? This is not what life is supposed to be. And I'm like, I know this is not what life is supposed to be. There's a lot of stuff that's not supposed to be here. So rather than go into contortions in order to say, all oh, this stuff is supposed to be here and it's all me and it's all God. I think that you have to do the more direct 
um, conclusion, which is that not all this stuff is supposed to be here. And some of the stuff is not supposed to be here. And some of the stuff is not you. And then the response is to send some of this stuff to entropy. So I don't 100% promote the ideas that I was sharing from 10 years ago, because I could see how it was misinterpreted in this filter of being here. But the truth is that you are a materialized embodiment of light. And because you are a materialized embodiment of light, the light that you contain did not go on its journey and it is circulating through you. But that is not a bad thing. It doesn't mean that you create a realm of demons that because this is kind of like almost blameful, like you had to have a body because you have a body and there's all of these demons you create. That is not what is going on. But do you understand that that is coming through your layers of trauma? Because you had these chakras before they were infested with demons. You had physical presence and a light body before you were assaulted by demons. You did not make demons happen as the foil or antithesis or balance to who you are as a light being. They are not supposed to exist. You don't have to take responsibility for their existence, either in a passive way or in a direct way, saying somehow that they are all your personality characteristics and that you must love and accept them and love them with a W and kumbaya with them. So that is another thing that I take great issue with, talking about different thought forms, different shadow beings, pathological structures, and when you interact with them, um, how you can, what, what, is the, what is the appropriate response in perceiving and interacting with them? Because when I spoke about this 10 years ago, I was saying, oh yeah, they're presenting themselves for healing, right? Like these demonic perturbations in the, in the field of time, space, and consciousness are presenting themselves to you. And that what they're really saying is, help me, fix me. I got a problem. I'm in pain and that's why I'm making you be in pain. And that is not truthful. That's actually not truthful. Some of them have no intention or desire of wanting to be fixed. They are totally making their choice. I would not say they are at peace with, but they are making their choice to be a piece of demonic S-H-I-T and not to change, not to grow, not to do their math homework correctly. They're not here for education. They are not here to accrete light. That was the presumption, we always project through who we are, of a light being who is here to accrete light. And I'm telling you guys 10 years ago, oh yeah, these demons are presenting themselves for healing. No, actually, a lot of them are not. A lot of them are not presenting themselves for any level of their own education, light accretion or resolution. Some of them are pathological, evil, demonic. They know exactly who they are. They know exactly what they're doing and they don't want to change. And so it is essential <clears throat> for you as a light being who is moving towards evolution, who is learning and growing and accreting more light and getting more and more wise to put that on, to put, Put that in your pocket and walk away with that recognition. Some of these guys aren't here to learn and they are not here to accrete light. That is the essence of flying rainbow lasagna. Some consciousnesses are here to learn and or impulses or characters. And you are meant to return to light speed, reconnect to God, go back to the source, uh, continue on the eternal journey of consciousness and some either characteristics or impulses or whatever we would call them are not here to evolve. They are devolving. They are moving slower and slower and slower and gyrating wildly out of control and moving away from light, away from the sun, away from the source that emanated them into a state of non-being that is called entropy. And they are not here to learn. So they, you don't have to teach them their ABCs and one, two, threes. They're like, good job, Mr. Demon. Now that you've mastered your ABCs and one, two, threes, now you can finally be at peace and go to entropy. You don't have to educate them. You don't have to anything them. You have to take all energy away from them. And that is big. 
So I also take issue with my lesson from 10 years ago where I talked about various different religious traditions that do conversions of demonic entities. Like it talks about Buddha who meditated so steadfastly that some of these demons that were kind of like, you're not going to send, you're not going to send, you're not going to send. They're like, this guy's meditating so hard. I'm going to stop being a demon and I'm going to start being a light being. That's what the, the story says. And uh, that's erroneous. You are not required to convert or redeem any demons. You are not required to inspire them to be anything other than what they are. In fact, love, the real love, not love and otters holding hands, tiny squirrels and things like that. True love is acceptance of who and what a thing is without requiring it to change. So a demon that comes and says, I'm blocking your ascension. I'm in front of you. I'm in front of you. Pay attention to me. Blah, make your life hard. Make your life hard. It's not actually there to be healed. It's, you don't have to educate it. And you don't have to turn it into an angelic presence or get it to be redeemed or send it back to the great galactic central sun. Be like, knock, 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 galactic central sun. Here's your bag of garbage. I don't know how it got in my face, but let's go do something with it. This is what light workers do. It's totally flawed. Sorry, light workers. I love you. Try to do the best you can under extraordinary circumstances without full view of what is actually supposed to, what you're actually supposed to be doing. Doing the best you can I'm here to hopefully give you light. You, so you can create more light. You're totally not only wasting your time, but doing something that is antithetical to the journey of those consciousnesses. Demonic consciousnesses that are trying to stand between you and your divine connection or your return to the source or your journey in freedom as consciousness, they don't need to go back to the great galactic center. They need to go to entropy. They need to stop being in existence. They don't just need to go back for recycling. It's hugely presumptive to think like, oh, you know, this demon has really got a ton of potential inside of it. Somehow it took a few wrong turns along the way, but now it's a twisted monster. But if we just send it back for recycling, oh, it's going to do it right the next time. That's a huge presumption. What makes you think it's going to do it better the next time? Maybe you're just sending back this demon that's going to be equally as demonic the next time, equally as pathological the next time. Really, why did it get to be pathological? This is me being a comedian. Why did it get to be pathological in the first place? Why did it get to be such a naughty pile of crap in the first place? No answer. Unless you find out what is the answer, why did this thing go awry and then prevent it from going awry again? That is a total, um, just endless nonsense that you're participating in if you're gonna send that back for recycling. And I think a lot of well-meaning light workers do something like that because something gave them that as their um, directive. Like, oh, you send it back to the source. You send it back to the galactic center. It's gonna get recycled. And it appeals to some aspect of your acculturization and what you consider to be compassion. But the most compassionate thing you can do with that piece of crap is send it to entropy because it is inherently flawed because it should not be in existence, because it is not necessary or didactic, because it is not part of the fabric of reality, because it is not a necessary foil or balance or shadow that is uh, an unintended consequence of the light that you are. You can have 100% light and zero shadow and have a reality structure. That's where I come from. Ah, here's my passion. I found my fire, good. I come from a place where there's 100% light and there's no shadow and there's no pathology and there's no poop and no crap. And guess what? You don't have to have the contrast of good versus evil in order to be able to see and sense what good is. I live in a place that is 100% good. It is 100% light. And I'm able to navigate in that space. How can I do that? Because light has different qualities. Look at my paintings. There's different colors. That's called light having different qualities. I'm able to navigate my home world realm by being able to see all these different qualities of light. Light can be various colors. It can be hard, it can be soft. It can be textured, it can pulse. It can be slow, it can be fast. It can have all of these different qualities to it. Just think in the same way that the nor nor far Northern uh, indigenous people have to whatever, 10,000 names for snow, all right? Snow can be like big and heavy and wet. 
small and tiny and fluffy and everything in between. Snow has all these different qualities. Light has all of these different qualities. And you don't have to have darkness and evil and pathology in order to be able to sense where the light is. So moving beyond that presumption, once you throw that out the window, then you go, wait a minute, I don't actually need to have the presence of evil in order to be able to perceive and appreciate the presence of good. I don't have to have doo-doo in order to appreciate ice cream cones. I can just have ice cream cones. Then you have a completely different worldview. Then like, what is all this doo-doo? Why is it here? It's not here for a purpose. It is preventing you from living in an expansive way because you're like, huh, tiptoe around that doo-doo. Don't get in there and don't get in there. I don't want that on me. And uh, having to deal with it. What if you're not only tiptoeing around doo-doo, but what if you're doing what the new age people call the shadow work? which is dive into doo-doo, analyze it with a microscope, see the undigested corn in there, you know, um, whatever, get, get um, up close and personal with all the doo-doos of the world. That is not what you wanna do at all. And in fact, I mean, like I hate scrubbing my own toilet. I put on like these big giant gloves, hold my breath, scrub, then it's done. Um, that's what you should be like with any of these pathogenic doo-doos. You should not be face to face with them and analyzing them. So I'll go more over this in subsequent lessons of the semester. But with your tendril of attention, it's your elephant's trunk and it's a sensory organ. And whatever you focus on, you are ingesting portions of. So I am encouraging you in this lesson to focus on the sun and secondarily the stars, because I do get a lot of great ideas. When I'm not beset by this stuff, and frequency and demonic and crap and all those things. And I sit in my lawn chair under the sky and I look up at the stars. I get the best ideas. That's where Path of Light came from. Um, I get uh, wonderful ideas um, from being able to connect with all of them. Um, that should be your focus because you're eating real food from healthy restaurants. And when you are focused to do the shadow work means that you're focusing your tendril of attention on all of the crap doo-doos and um, you're internalizing pieces of them. And that's not healthy. It's not good. You should only touch on doo-doos in order to be like, oh, I don't like that. Like when I'm walking around and you smell like there's, there's definitely dog doos around here somewhere. Just go away from it because I don't like that smell. It's, it's revolting for a reason. We're not supposed to gravitate towards or focus on those substances or exudations or obstacles that's pathology or corruption, then you're not supposed to have to analyze it. So this is difficult because, you know, since the past four years or so, definitely since 2016, there has been a cultural awakening here, a recognition of trigger, trigger warning, you know, satanic ritual abuse, um, um, horrible practices, not practices, horrible crimes that are perpetrated against vulnerable classes in your society, against children, indigenous women, um, people who don't have a voice and don't have an advocate, they're sold into slavery, sexually exploited, a lot of bad stuff, all right? And for many, many years, it's been swept under the carpet. Everything from vaccinations as a satanic sacrifice, CPS and foster system, um, taking children into what is a, like a, a mill for abuse, you know, like a, a systemic um, tendency to be sexually abused, um, Hollywood, the music industry, politics, exploitation of children, non-consensual sexual contact. It's a sewer, all right? It's very, very positive that humanity has come to its senses enough to be able to be like, something stinks around here. And then once you recognize that, then you are empowered to begin to act against it. But what is not healthy is diving into the sewer and analyzing it on every level and ingesting and internalizing so much of that. It is hugely emotionally destabilizing and not that good to do. Only touch on it lightly, really, really, really. And I know some people are investigative journalists. They need to wear what you wear when you are a plumber and you're going into a like septic tank to clean it or fix it or whatever. You need to have a big giant rubber suit so you don't get that stuff on you. Because otherwise, it gets into your pores, gets underneath your fingernails, affects you because you're marinating in that stuff. 
So please be super conscientious, educate yourself, know that those things happen, feel validated in your concerns, feel validated if you have, uh, if you are a victim experience or survivor of any of those atrocities, then of course there's a huge amount of compassion and a lot of healing that is being sent towards you. And it's, you have a vested interest in wanting to end that system. And I also have a very vested interest in wanting to end that system. So, so many of us do, um, but don't, don't um, ingest sewer water because it's very, very full of pathogens and it's not good to be too focused on that. So you know that that bad stuff exists, you know you gotta change it from your society. Don't spend 12 hours a day hyper-focused on it because I think that that is not going to bring you in the direction that you want to go. And um, you will at a certain point have to kind of like purge the emotional responses that you have to smelling all that crap and knowing that it's there in order to be able to go into um, more exalted realms. None of this is denial because you're like, yep, that's definitely a sewer, but you just don't want to bring that bad smell with you when you enter into realms that are about instantaneous manifestation. So let me all speak a little bit now more about the rapport with the sun and the stars. And I'll get to your comments. I'm sorry, I've been on a roll here. Your um, connection to the sun and the stars as being directly connected to manifestation. So I think I mentioned the process of sun gazing and bringing that energy through your chakras and reconnecting to the sun. It uses some of the same pathways as orgasm. It uses some of the same pathways of what is called kundalini, which is a word that comes from Asia and Hindu tradition, the energy rising up your spine. But key word or key takeaway, it is non-sexualized. And just like in your society, because your society is really pathogenic right now, you don't have very many um, opportunities in your society for healthy non-sexualized nudity. Most of the people are like, oh, like if you're walking around with no clothes on, like you're looking for sex, as opposed to you're trying to get tan or something like that. So that's one of the things, like there's not very many opportunities for you to just be um, non-sexualized in your nudity. And there is a huge focus on the, well, girl, girl. okay, actually this was my mind just now. Be like, girl, like I could tell you all about what's wrong with the way that you guys do sex, but I just don't even wanna turn this lecture into that. But um, so much talking and posturing and uh, you know cu cultural things about sex that are talking about it, but they are not talking about the actual um, energetic pathways of orgasm. So you should, you should, if you're gonna have like a conversation about sex in your society, you should talk about like, what is orgasm? How is it achieved? What is actually happening on a spiritual level? But that conversation doesn't happen because it is hugely empowering to know that even beyond knowing where babies come from, we're talking about reality manifestation. So this is still held largely in the levels of obscured esoterica, where people talking about doing sex magic or manifestation spells, but really you are utilizing personal creative life force energy as it flows through your pleasure centers and up your spine of your body to make things happen. And you should do that as an adult as a conscious participant in the world, taking responsibility for your creations as you are a miniature sun, like the sun created the planet and all the biology here and takes responsibility for its creations. The sun is not actually having sex with a partner. It is creating through its mind. And you are also using your creative life force energy in moments of intimacy and in the act of orgasm to create and generate reality. When you do sun gazing, it is as if you are making love with the sun, but there are not the unhealthy dynamics that are overlays and projections that largely happen in your world of human biological dynamics, where you're like, who's on top? Who's in charge in the relationship? Who will make sandwiches? And other silly things that are isms of your world that I have learned about, but I do not participate in. Um, it's not a a power dynamic between who's being exploited and who is benefiting and who is getting off. It's a respectful partnership of equals between yourself and the sun. 
just and to you know say that it uses orgasm pathways and then say that it's like being a child and a parent this just becomes very very complex and unpleasant so i have to just speak directly and don't use any allegories here but um you're making reality happen so i talked about getting your directives from the sun and working on projects but you're also directly um creating generating reality with that energy that comes forward from the act of sun gazing when you do that alley-oop and you get your you make basketball and you're connecting to the sun at the highest level like that you are um manifesting and generating and it's something that should supersede your ego desires like i want gold bars or whatever diamond toilet seat or whatever it is that's not what you really want i always tell people that what you really want is freedom. What you really want is freedom, not materialism. So people think when I talk about manifesting and especially when people are doing sex magic, a lot of it's on the lower level of just wanting to get stuff. Like this is an expediency to get stuff. You're not supposed to do it just to get stuff. You're supposed to do it in order to positively influence and reshape reality. You will have the stuff that you need, but you need more than stuff. You need freedom. It's if you had whatever is the stuff that you think you want, like diamonds, gold, whatever, a giant boat, don't really want those things. You want the capacity to enjoy those things because you can have diamonds, but what if they chop off your hands and you can't wear your diamonds? What if you have a boat, but there's a giant storm and you can't actually go out sailing? You have money, but you're not actually allowed to spend it. The economy crashes, it's worth nothing. Like you don't want the department of ironic wish missed fulfillment to give you exactly what you wish for, but in a negative context, which is all these myths about like the monkey's paw, things that go horribly awry, or Homer Simpson's turkey sandwich that he got from wishing for it, but the turkey was a little dry. You don't want that. You want to have the fulfillment of your truest desires. You don't wish for material things. You wish for feeling states and potentials. You wish for freedom. You wish to live in a healthy way where you are not beset or molested by pathology, where you are free to express yourself and learn and grow, where you have all of the resources and edifices that are required for your growth. When people wish for money, that's what they are really wishing for. The resources and edifices that are required for their growth. So you don't want ironic misfulfillment where it's like, here's a bunch of money. And you're like, hooray, I can finally take that pottery class I've always been wanting to take. And then all of a sudden, like they chop off your arms and you can't do pottery anymore. You don't want that. You want the freedom of being able to explore yourself and do everything that you want to do with all of the resources that you need. That is literally what ascension is. So sun gazing is mini ascension. Sun gazing is the smaller, like I lift five pound weights. I don't lift a hundred pounds. Lifting a hundred pounds is ascension. So when you are doing sun gazing each day, you are building the foundation muscle and the biological architecture to be able to do ascension. Ascension is when you are able to get a fire hose of light coming into you. You don't get incinerated. You are uplifted and energized by it. And you're not just manifesting something small, like I'm going to write a song. I'm going to sun gaze with the sun. I'm going to get an idea. I'm going to come inside. I'm going to write a song. It's my job for the day. And at the end of the day, I listen to the song while I sun gaze. It's more than that. When you ascend, you've got a fire hose of ideas coming directly into you. And you are in a constant rapport with yourself and the sun. And you're doing even more than painting a painting or writing a song you're generating the symphony of life along with the sun, all right? So I think I hit most of the highlights. I always send out my notes with the emails. So that's part of the value of being an enrolled student that um, you can also find my notes even if you don't wanna enroll, like this is not a sales pitch, I just love all of you. Um, you can always find them in the compilation, the PDF called the Lasagna Flight Manual that is always in the description of my videos. So read my notes. Do your homework, watch the whiteboards, enroll if you're not already enrolled. And um, because I always go past things fast. I'm like, oh, that was good stuff. I should talk about that stuff. So wait, cheeky needs hugs. And then also I need to, to go to these questions. Pedro says, can we say, oh, and we got to admit someone who just hopped out of the meeting. Hold on, I got to drink the water. 
Thank you. Pedro says, can we say that the sun is the face of God seen through a pinprick and the fabric with space time? Yes, no. First, I'm going to hug Cheeky and we're going to talk about this. Yes, you could say that the sun is the face of God. I think that's actually a beautiful poetic allegory, but not the sense that it is a pinprick in the fabric of space and time because it's a little bit too close to some pretty ancient ideas, um, the ancient people who were not very informed and looked at the world as if it was like, like there was a bowl, like a ceramic bowl or something like that, like a colander over earth with different holes in it and that they perceived um, this, the light of the stars as being light that is coming through the opening of this colander like you know covering on your planet around your world that's not what's going on so it's not like there's a world of pure light and then you, know, you get these little tiny emanations into this world which is the flawed materialistic like bad wrong modern world of darkness um but the sun is the face of god in the same way that if you looked at your neurons when they are flashing and thinking and doing stuff in your mind that it exemplifies who you are. You know, your personality and your thought structure and who you are and everything that is important to you is embodied or shown in the patterning of your neuro neuron activity in your brain. So when we see the sun shining in the sky, what we are really looking at is the patterned activity of one neuron of a very, very large divine mind. And that is a beautiful, truthful allegory. But the light and where light emanates from does not come through like an obstacle that then has like a little aperture that comes into this world. It's more than that. So the sun is a portal and it's a portal that's like a, a, a time tunnel that connects it to the galactic center. But here's what you need to know. Like just your question is good, but just you have to get into really sophisticated levels to comprehend this. Every single photon is a doorway and a portal into every single other photon. There's only one photon. Your language is inadequate for me to be able to express what I need to express. But every single photon is the accumulated narrative structure and contains within it the emanative truth of every single journey that every single photon has ever taken ever in any time, place, across all time, space, and dimensionality. Okay. Pedro also says, can we burn away nano with sun gazing? Mwah! The answer is yes, if, let's go to the whiteboard, if, if, where's the eraser? If you could erase these poo poo caca doos, oops, not the tree, but the doos that are behind the tree, and then get all of this beautiful light um, to flow through you, they change color to the light color. Cheeky wants to go outside. Cheeky's gonna be fine. Just what, nothing is working. Okay, just for, forget about it. But if you could get all of that, nothing is working. Oh, that has just changed to a thing. Just a thing, a thing, a thing, a thing right here. If you could get all this light to flow into this light, rather, to flow into here, then you would be able to fry your nano with the light of the sun. But this is the real problem, is that you've got the pink sun, this thing over here coming between you, EMF doo-doos coming between you, sky particles coming between you, and then the stuff that's implanted in your actually body coming between you, all right? Now I will rant. If I'm a responsible son, you know, the last thing in the world that I should allow is for any obstacles to be erected between myself and the ones that I'm supposed to be feeding and caring for with my light. The sun knows that the sky poops exist. It has been a concerted effort over 10 years to invade your biological architecture with those fibers. It didn't happen in two seconds. And even if it did happen in two seconds, the sun would know about it and would be able to respond. Unfathomable why the sun did not respond. I'm a responsible adult. Like if I'm your mama, I'm your mama, all right? And I'm like, I gotta feed my baby applesauce. I'm trying to put the applesauce into your face. And someone keeps stealing your applesauce. 
I'm a responsible mom. I'm like, I got to take care of this. Someone's stealing my baby's applesauce. This kid's got to get fed. That's not what the son did. All right. It's just honest, just honest. And as fair as the little baby that you are for you to be like, where well, I want my applesauce. What's going on, mommy? Why aren't you feeding me? It's fair. Cause you know what? If you're a parent, you're like, I'm going to get my baby that applesauce no matter what. And I don't care who I have to kill. You get it? That is what it is to be a parent. So I don't know what is wrong with the son. I don't know why it didn't act in that fiercely protective way that it should act. It should have fried all nano. It should have fried the 5G as it was being erected. If I'm trying to feed my baby applesauce and they're going to put up some kind of 5G infrastructure between me and my baby, I would be like, zap, zap, zap. Get out of town. You are not allowed to do that. That didn't happen. My past four years has been an education in profound disappointment as to the things that did not happen from higher dimensional and extremely wise light beings that should have happened. I don't have an answer as to why they didn't protect their babies and make sure that you could eat your applesauce. All I have is my response, which after my own incredibly horrific assaults from this 5G and fibers and different things that were trying to take over me, to find the inner reserves and the augmentation to be able to do this, which is also why at this point, you know, my son gazing, it's not like, okay, son, tell me what to do. Because, uh, you know, I'm like the son, I'm like, I'm gonna tell you what to do. These guys are trying to steal everybody's applesauce. You gotta stop this. The power dynamics has shifted in some way where it's like, I don't know why you're not doing this, but I'm directing you that you need to do this. So, um, I actually have huge conflict in every minute of my day as I appear to be more responsible and more capable than a literal effing son. Like I weigh 130, I have 130 pounds of mass. It has like whatever, 132 million times the mass of your planet. I'm making that up. I don't know exactly how many times more massive, but more massive than your planet. Your planet's mass is this tiny and the mass of the sun is this entire room. And I weigh 130 pounds. Like, how can I be more responsible than this massive object of light being in the sky? But somehow I am. And that's it. It makes me feel very, very angry and disappointed. So, you know, when I felt anger and disappointment at watching my video from lat from 10 years ago, it's not just at like, oh, like this world has been so peed and pooped upon and everything is so unfair. It's that. And you guys trying to evolve pee and poop on your heads, getting no applesauce, but it's also who the F is out to lunch? You know what I'm seeing? Electrical cords that did not get properly coiled up. This is me. I come into the utility closet. I'm like, hey, somebody didn't coil up this electrical cord. Who was working here? That was the sun. The sun didn't coil that up. I'm going to give the son the benefit of the doubt. Maybe he had a tummy ache and had to go home early. And that's why he didn't do his job right. But that is unacceptable. And I think we need to call uh, whatever, human resources, call him the supervisor and have a big talk about this. Because you can't just pile up these electrical cords this way. And I, meanwhile, I'm not just going to complain about it. I'm going to organize these electrical cords. Organize all your tapes and duct tape and post-it notes too. Because that's who I am. That's what I do. So uh, the answer is unfathomable, um, but please uh, try to remain strong and find the things that you can do that are personal empowerments to be able to act effectively in this incredibly unjust situation. So Pedro also says, can the Merkaba filter out the fake light? Yes, but, and it was not enough for me. So when I got really assaulted by the fake light about uh, you know three years or so ago, what I had to learn was a variety of things, not learn, but develop, and innovate ways to be able to respond to this. So it wasn't enough for me just to lasagna back and forth to the sun because that stuff that they put inside of me and the stuff they put around your whole planet makes it very, very effing difficult to do that. And so what I had to learn was how to purge myself of the nano. And what I do at this point is similar to working with the lithography of cosmic architecture or surface structures that hold the molecular structures of things together in the world. So I had to like get a PhD in how to shape matter in order to unbond the 
molecular chemical bonds of stuff that's in my body that's not supposed to be there and unbond it. And then in doing that, it has, I it focus on clearing the nano around my pineal gland and a couple of other um, vital architectures in my brain. And then once those things are free, that then I'm able to use those things effectively to do things like reach the sun and be telepathic and um, you know do healing work on other people. But I use a capacity that is beyond the pineal gland because it's hug cheeky a little bit more. She's getting upset. Come here, come here. Um, if you only have the pineal gland, come here, hug, come here, hug me, hug me. And the pineal gland gets infested by something called nanotechnology. I said the word. I hope we don't get struck by lightning. Um, then that's it. You're kaput. It's like your windshield of your car is encrusted with ice and you can't see and you ain't going anywhere. And the little, um, you know, windshield wipers and defoggers, none, none of that is working. And ostensibly your pineal gland is the thing that you use to defrost your windshield. So if it's closed down, you are uh, SOL. That's something out of luck. And what I have learned is I have to find a higher faculty, even beyond my higher faculties. And in doing that, I use my higher faculties to defrost the windshield, get my pineal gland functional again, and then be able to be effective against these horrible invaders that are not supposed to be there. So there is a capacitation that is even higher than Christ consciousness. This, this up here, which is your divine connection. And when you get into that level, you are able to do things that recapacitate the pineal gland. And a lot of this is anti, it is sacrilegious. I just spoke to you guys sacrilegiously because the Christian church and religious writings state that the only way to blah, 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 enlightenment and freedom is through Christ. The I'm the way and the light, and it's the only way to get there. I'm sorry to be mocking your religion right now, but right now that would be like saying the only way to clear off the and defrost the windshield so I can drive the car is through the power of the windshield wipers. And the power of the windshield wipers is clearly not adequate in this particular ice storm that you are facing. So if you are busy worshiping the power of the windshield wipers and you think that that is going to get you through this storm, then it's a terrible situation. You know what you have to do? You have to get like the giant ice scraper and get out of the car and scrape the ice that's off of your windshield in order for your windshield wipers to even get going. So I gave you a sacrilege right now. You actually have to go beyond the dogma of the Christian church that says you must put 100% of your faith and expectation for help amelioration of your situation and save your, save your ship into the presence known as Jesus Christ. And that that's the only way to get to heaven. It's the only way to be saved. And that that's the only thing to do. It's like saying, put your faith in, in Jesus Christ or put your faith in the sun and these windshield wipers are going to work one day. And I am here to tell you a very, very difficult, inform you of a very, very difficult truth is that that will not happen. You actually have to defrost your windshield in spite of the fact that Christ consciousness, the Christ network, truly benevolent teacher from 2000 years ago is not helping right now. And that the sun who should be incinerating all of this the sun should send out a blast that incinerates this out of existence. Hasn't done so. And I cannot predict when it will or if it ever will. I certainly would have many, many conversations with it saying, don't you think it's time for you to do that? Because it's been since 2019, it should have done that. So that's five years overdue. Say, hey, you who's up there in the sky, what's the matter? Why are you doing this thing five years late? And if I got really, really mad about it, I could say, here's a long list of people, plants, and animals that died because you didn't do the thing you were supposed to do five years ago. Like, I'm doing your job for you. I've been doing it for five years. It ain't easy. And uh, a lot of people are dying. Doing the best I can down here. Why aren't you doing something about this? This is to the sun. Because the sun should reach out like a surgeon 
not even just like a giant blast of light on this whole planet, incinerating all technology, but should reach out like a surgeon and go through every cell of your body, find this stuff that's not supposed to be there and effing incinerate it. It's its job. It has not been doing its job. And this is much, much more than just not coiling up the electrical cords. This is enough to be able to destroy the entire company and uh, all of the employees at the company. It's a very, 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 very big way of dropping the ball. So you got the sun in the sky. You also have all of these, um, you know, sent the sense the son of God and the son of God and religious worship of the son and religious worship of Christ and the dogma of the church that says you must worship and you must um, expect this savior and only the windshield wipers will save, will save you. The only way to get through the storm is to rely upon the windshield wipers. But your windshield is frozen over and your wipers don't actually move. What do you do? You can just die of disappointment. Can't do that. You have to do something have to reach beyond. You have to say, if that guy's out to lunch, if that guy ain't doing his job, I'm going to do his job. Because you know what? This company is not going down. This planet and this ascension is protected. And it's going to go forward nonetheless. And it's going to triumph. And you're going to regain your capacitations, even if the windshield wipers don't work, even if the sun isn't doing its job. And I told this to you two weeks ago, they ain't doing their job. You do it. You take their job. Like, I do that job now. That's it. It's non-negotiable because the job must be done. So when I talk about the windshield wipers, what I'm talking about is the ability to clear this stuff out of your third eye. This stuff has infested almost everybody's third eye. No one is immune. Not in any channeler. Says, Dear ones, a message from the Galactic Federation. They're infested. All right. Everybody is infested. And I do the best that I possibly can to clear out my pineal gland so that I am not infested and then use my pineal gland to clear out others' pineal glands. First of all, that is the directive of anybody that has a functional pineal gland. You don't just sit around in the way that is presumed with where's my gem? Hold on a second. Oh, I've hung it up somewhere. Here we go. Here we go. You don't just sit around like this, my diamond ring, my giant diamond ring. Like, oh, I have an active pineal gland and you don't. But look at me, look what I can do. You don't do that. It is not that type of a situation. If you have an active pineal gland and you can do literal miraculous magical things, what's the first thing you're gonna do? You're just gonna serve yourself? No, of course not. You're gonna fix everyone. You're gonna fix yourself, you're gonna fix everyone. You're not just going to defrost your own windshield, you're going to defrost everybody's windshield so that everybody can effing see where they are going and have a fighting chance to be able to get through this incredible amount of injustice and difficulty. So that that's it. Like, I don't know where the head windshield wiper guy is. If he was active in the way that it is supposed to be, then he would come here and defrost everybody's windshield. That hasn't happened. I'm like, fine, I'll do it. That's what I've been doing, guys, truly. And uh, we're totally, like, without prevarication here, it's not just self-aggrandizement, um, do it all the time. And uh, you know what I think? Maybe he's got frozen windshield wipers. Maybe that guy who's the head windshield wiper guy has frozen windshield wipers. And you know what? I will defrost his windshield wipers too. And I know I have a lot of attitude, but I'm just going to defrost it and I'm not going to rub his nose in it and be like, hey, you know, a lot of people died and you're very, very late and this has been very, very wrong. I'm just going to do it. And same thing with the sun. I'm just going to be like, look, I know you should have fried all of this stuff with surgical precision years ago and you didn't. I'm going to do it. And I want all of you guys to get capacitated and to do it as well. So the upshoot of all this is, please do not believe in flawed dogma. Please do not outsource your capacitations even to something that is as large and grand scale as a sun. Because even if you're a comparatively a fruit fly flying out of my garbage can, you still are a consciousness. You still have your willpower. You still have your own divinity. You are as valid as a heroic world savior as a giant, whatever, planetary or, you know, stellar object, and you can do it. And I send out the, you know, lasagna DNA information about how to do it all the time. And it's, I think, the best story, I didn't want to say story, but the best upshoot of all this would be like, oh, yeah, 
Yeah, we defrost all the windshields. And when the head windshield guy comes along, he's like, okay, I got the, got the windshield defroster for you. And you've already got your windshields defrosted. And you already saved your planet. And you already kicked all the evil sewage monsters out of here. And you're already doing everything you need to do. They're like, thank you very much. You've already defrosted the windshield and we are doing great. Not that I don't want you to be here, but we had to do something. Thank you very much. I'm sorry, that sounds very, very sour, but I definitely found my disappointment and anger in this ranty lecture. Trish says, or accept any of their darkness inside of us as part of us on the topic of new age shadow work or accept them as skills, manipulation, et cetera. This is how our vessels are being driven by the one shadow pers persona identical in all for specifically ego allowing our true light to be used falsely playing the role written for us in this construct instead of living in unconditional loving purposefully and oscillating frl style very very beautifully well said thank you for that joyce says birthing children can also be an orgasmic experience from what i understand yes so i've never had a physical child but i do know many women who have and the birth process can be so different for every single different type of woman like sometimes it's incredibly painful. And sometimes there has to be a hospital intervention. Sometimes there has to be a surgical intervention. And sometimes there's a huge recovery afterwards. And some women have an easier delivery and yes, even orgasmic feelings. And then their recovery is very, very fast. So I think you can't judge anybody. You've got to celebrate every mom that's been able to successfully birth their child into this world. It's a miracle that it happens here at all. And um, it's not that you're a bad mom or you didn't do enough yoga beforehand to be able to like I know a lot of health, healthy moms and the pregnancy doesn't always go the way you want it to go and it doesn't always happen exactly the right way and you know what else not everybody has nutritional support not everybody has a jacuzzi not everybody has like financial support not everybody has the type of birth that they want to have and some people have they're dealing with body issues so there's no judgment on all of that but in terms of planetary birth I've said this to you many many times you should be having an orgasmic ascension experience you should be feeling like you are elated genuinely rising up through the most extraordinary levels of consciousness i don't know i don't take drugs but like if you took some kind of a drug like better than any kind of drug you could possibly take feeling more exalted happy peaceful calm and creative than any substance could ever make you feel and it never ends and everybody around you is feeling that good this should feel like paradise and that is the antithesis of what you're experiencing. You are experiencing right now hell on earth. Like you're interpenetrated by demons. What do you think this stuff is? This stuff is demons. And you know what? I mean, I'm very, very down on the dogma of the religion, but also that head windshield wiper guy, he is renowned for ejecting demons from people. He's, he's got a lot of work to do. Like, I'm like, you know, clearly the utility closet needs to be organized. There's a lot of work to be done here. Um, somebody needs to come and eject these demons. Um, so yes, but perhaps he's got car trouble or has a tummy ache. Well, there's a reason. I'll give him the benefit of the doubt. We'll see. Steve says, can we ask questions to the sun? Yes, you can. It says, do we have our tendril developed enough before we can receive answers? Yes. You can absolutely ask questions and that is very appropriate, but you have to be really, really cautious about receiving your answers through a pineal gland that has this crapola in it, and then also through flood cultural filters and other systems of interpretation. So the whole idea of like when people are doing like channeling and work with their spirit guides, work with their angel guides, there's all sorts of astral nincompoops and imposters that are like, I'm your spirit guides, I'll tell you this, and they tell you totally a lie or the wrong thing. So even though it's theoretically possible to have an entire conversation with the sun, question and answer and receive all sorts of verbalized responses through your verbal mental filters, in this time and place, you must be super skeptical of anything that you are receiving in terms of a mental broadcast, because how do you know it's really from the sun? How do you know that that's really truthful? How do you know that that's not just some astral imposter? How do you know that the sun didn't send the energy to you and then have it go through caca poo poo filters and then get to you? And this is this lack of discernment is actually why it is worthy that some aspects of the new age are worthy of ridicule because you have people who are connecting to dubious, connecting dubiously to what they perceive to be a source of information when it is actually misinformation and then they propagate that information through communities in ways that are not helpful. So ideally get your tendril going, 
get your light body um, up to speed, um, cultivate your pie making apparatuses, get an industrial um, bakery situation going in your pineal gland and be able to know and comprehend beyond words in the purest levels of your insight and then have all of your questions and answers through there. But please preferably do not do your Q and A and questing through your anthropocentric filter at this level, which is where all the naughty things, imposters hang out, um, pretending, giving you um, misleading information and really um, attempting to um, overturn your trajectory, that they are really uh, saboteurs and not um, informants in your journey. But that's an excellent question. And Steve also says, so best to clear the pineal gland as much as possible. Yes, yes, yes. So you not only need to clear your pineal gland, which is here, but you also need to reestablish your crown connection, which is your direct connection to God. So, just, I mean, I know I'm on a religious rant right now, but one of my other real problems with Christian dogma is to say to only go to God through your belief in uh, Jesus Christ as it is presented by the church. When in this world, what you really need to do is to establish your direct connection to God with no intermediaries. And this is tough because it means not only not using Jesus as a bridge, but also not using the sun and the stars as a bridge. And so if I am disappointed in the quality of information or intervention that is coming from both of those two things or people or groups or organisms, I'm like, I'm going directly to God. And that is the healthiest and best response that I can give you in this context that I share information with you, you know, in this time place, pretty much total skepticism of any kind of intermediary, go directly to God. And that really, that does help because sometimes it's so difficult to connect with the sun that there's so much pollution that it can be just difficult to connect to the sun, but then just to connect with God. And again, none of this is the um, uh, response of the hyper-traumatized to go into hyper-self-reliance. Like, that's it. I don't need any of you suckers. Get out of here. I'm just, you know, only me and God. But it is kind of that. But it's not just from, you know, trauma response. It is because there are, your skepticism is well warranted and you should be skeptical um, in recognizing that there's a huge amount of pollution and that you really can't trust any of these things and trusting in them when you know that there are flaws is not an effective um, uh, you know, behavioral approach. Like if somebody didn't do something at the job, at your business, and even if they're the CEO and they didn't coil up the electrical you know, equipment for the supply closet, you'd be like, wow, oh, like even the CEO didn't do that. Doesn't matter, I'm gonna do it. And also I'm gonna recognize sometimes the CEO doesn't even do what is supposed to be done for whatever reason. And that's it because I'm doing me. Like you're you, you do you, I do me. You don't wanna take responsibility and do this thing, that's fine. I will do it. And all I have is the you know, five senses um, information. Is the electrical cord coiled up or is it not? Is the world infested with this stuff or is it not? If it's infested with the stuff and like somebody didn't do their job, that's it. And at a certain point, I'm not about castigating people and allaying blame. I just want to get the job done. That is how I really feel about this. So that, and this is me after like four years of processing all of this because I've gone into a lot of incapacitative, you know, mental swirls, mental spirals when you're like, but they got to do something about this. Like you can't leave that electrical cord untied like that, like so dangerous and it didn't happen. So that at that, at a certain point, I'm like, okay, like you, you relinquish that expectation that the CEO is going to coil up the electrical cord. You're like, I am going to do it. And that has given me a huge amount of mental peace and empowerment. And that is how also I have like rebuilt my life, rebuilt my health, gotten to levels of self-empowerment and continue to teach you guys. Like if I didn't do this, if I didn't protect myself and clear this stuff out of my body, I would be assimilated into the Borg. I wouldn't be teaching my class. I wouldn't be my true self. I wouldn't be lasagna. We tried to eradicate all of that stuff out of me. And the sun didn't stop them. And the head windshield wiper guy didn't stop them. And these are sad truths. And I had to do it myself.
So even though they tried to eradicate me and tried to disempower me and amputate everything that I am, I'm like, I'm going to have to do this myself. And I did it. And that's why I'm here. And that's why I'm like looking and feeling good. And also, I want you to know out of not any sense of bragging, but out of a sense of reassurance, because you're like the CEO didn't do this. Is anybody doing anything? I have healed and cleared out myself. And I work every day to heal and clear out you guys too. That is not a question in terms of free will. It is not an imposition upon your free will for me to clear out this stuff from your pineal gland and from your bloodstream and from your body so that you can be capacitated again. That's totally appropriate. I don't have to be like, can I have your direct consent? Like you're drowning you know, in a sea of sharks and be like, can you please sign this consent form before I help you? It's like, no, I'm going to help you. We can work it out later. Like I'm sure, you know, like if you want to go back into the shark infested waters, go back in. But um, this is what I do. Yeah, because that's that's the right thing to do. So yeah, I don't just like, it would be incredibly self-serving. I was like, oh, great, magical superpowers. I'll just do me and then you guys do you and you can all swirl down the toilet. I'm like, no, I'm going to do me and I'm going to do all of you at the same time. So that is literally what I do. That's it. <laughs> so I'm, I'm doing everybody's utility closet. You're going to have the best organized utility closets that it is possible to have because I'm on the job. I'm doing it. And that's it. So that, I mean, I hope that this is coming across with a huge amount of humor. Yes. Steve says, thank you. Aurora. very helpful. Um, you know, it's a very, very difficult situation. You're in a, a battle. And in many of my teachings, I'm like, let's not use the language of war because we're in a spiritual unfoldment. Now I'm like, F that. No, you're in a battle and something is trying to kill you. It's trying to destroy everything. And so I just have to presume like, Maybe someone else is incapacitated. Maybe the sun is incapacitated. Maybe there is some breakdown in the lines of communication or capacitation or whatever it is. But, you know, like in a war like this, just at a certain point, you don't have to ask those questions. You're like, oh, okay, like that isn't happening. That guy didn't do that. That organization or group didn't do that. And now we have to do something about this. That's it. Like just simple, a pragmatic response to what is um, literally unthinkable because there have been so many failed fail safes that you should never be in this position. Like this is also like real talk. You guys, you should never be in this position. You are dangling precariously and the most incredible, valuable things like you, your consciousness, your souls are being like dangled over uh, the abyss of non-existence. And like that should never happen. You don't do that. You don't do that with like precious gems and jewels and things like that. Um, so th even that it has gotten devolved to this point is almost uh, inconceivable and unthinkable. And yet we are here. And so it is essential to have an effect response. So what I would say for each one of you, again, coming of age under extraordinary and unprecedented and aberrant conditions, the very first thing that you want to do is clear out your pineal gland the best that you can. Oh, okay, so very briefly, what are the things you can do to clear this stuff out of you? I have a whole class that's all about this. Like I can run a rerun if you want me to, but there's biochemical stuff you can do, me mechanical or based in like, um, you know, ma machinery stuff that you can do, and then spiritual work. And I would say begin in, in that order of to get parasites and stuff out of you and out of your um, body. So the first thing is like, don't ingest fluoride and other things that directly ass assault your pineal gland. Don't ingest subcutaneous pollutions. That should go without saying. If you have ever had them, please cease immediately. Um, so don't get pollution inside of you. And then the next thing is, what can you do to get pollution out of you? Methylene blue paired with liposomal vitamin C is very effective. I take that every day. I also do an intestinal antiparasite that's called Panicure, which is also known as Fendebrazole. You can um, alternate that with Ivermectin because there is an aspect of parasite to these things. Methylene blue is an old fashioned malaria medicine and the liposomal vitamin C helps it to go uh, through your fatty tissues and across your blood brain barrier into your brain and clear out your brain. So those are some of the biochemical stuff. You can also do fluorine dioxide solution. I do it underneath my tongue, but not all the way through my digestive tract. And I use the buffered method that I can share a video about how to do that. I think it was Dr. Andre Kalker that shows how to do this so that it won't kind of like um, sting your tissues quite so much. Um, but you don't want to drink it every day because it'll destroy your microbiome. But small amounts of that, people also call that 
um, miracle mineral solution, but that definitely helps against the nano. Um, let's go into um, frequency stuff. So this is my anti-5G um, crystalline uh, device called IBAMAC from Germany. These are great. You know what does not help against nano? Spooky Rife machines, Healy, which is another one of these frequency devices. And um, there's one other, I can't remember what it was, um, but um, these guys are creating frequencies that, oh, the terahertz wand. I'm very sorry, people are achieving some miraculous results with ail easing their ailments with the terahertz wand. And I think that it's because they're allowing it, the nano architecture to more deeply infest them. I don't think it's helping by clearing the architecture. I think that it is making it so that your biological body becomes at one with the terahertz signal and routes its own signals through the nano architecture, like you're making friends with the nano friends instead of fighting against it. So I would say please stay away from the terahertz wand. I don't think that's good, but these guys are great. Spooky and rife machines ostensibly are great, but the components are manufactured in China and they are not pure frequencies anymore. And um, stay away from dental work because there's um, nano architecture that is in the, the lidocaine that they inject into people so that your teeth will be numb when they drill you. So stay away from that and um, from other, because um, the rife machines make tendrils grow from the lidocaine. This is just like a, a, a brief example of what's going on. Um, so frequency stuff that does work, incandescent infrared, which is what you should be getting from the sun. Incandescent infrared. The sun is a giant incandescent plasma ball that should be emitting a huge amount of infrared light, both optical and heat. The heat fries the nano and it also um, makes it not is as easily possible for it to send its false light signals through your body. Yeah, um, because it's working on particular frequencies to flash false light through your body. So when you're in the presence, uh, I got my chicken light, which is an incandescent red bulb that they use for brooding chicks. Just get one of those, it's like 30 bucks. Don't burn your house down, use it safely. Don't, don't burn yourself or anyone else in your family. But I use that every night, set it up next to my bed. And I also do a huge amount with topical melatonin. So melatonin is another one that is um, emitted from your pineal gland, part of the orchestration of your light body and is a huge ally. And you should be producing it naturally, but you're not because of the presence of blue light in your home electronics, LED lights, and the false sun that is in the sky. So all of these lights inhibit your melatonin production. And melatonin is not about making you feel sleepy and fall asleep at night. It is really about cellular regeneration and protecting your cell walls and 5G breaks your cell walls. So three milligrams of melatonin taken orally is not enough. You need to take 300 milligrams per day. Some people do this through suppositories, but I've been finding I can put it into topicals. And also I found a good um, transdermal patch that I do. And the melatonin helps fantastically. It's so basically everything that supports your pineal gland you want to do. And then um, I also have a plasma wand that it just zaps them, but it's not enough to just zap them. Like you have to zap them and then you have to detox. So you also need to take chlorella or a zeolite, which is a binder to help remove them. And then the final thing is the spiritual work, which is what I was telling you about. To be able to reach with your mind the surface of reality words don't work, lithography, the convoluted unseen presence that holds molecules together and to break the molecular structures of the things that are trying to bond inside of your body. So it is achieving a mastery over matter in order to clear the architecture of your body. And as you also gain in your capacitation, you will become non-local, which means that you can do it for yourself you like you can put your mind into your toe, clean out your toe, even though your toe is six feet away from your head. And you can also, if you can do six feet away from your head, you can do a person who's standing six feet away. You can do a person who's across the street. You can do a person who's one town over. You can do a person who lives a, a continent away. It's what non-local is. So you master the capacity to clear this stuff out of your body by breaking the chemical molecular bonds that hold it together. And there's both the metallic infrastructure, kind of a biological bioweapon mycoplasma type of thing that is semi 
DNA related, but not fully built with DNA that grows on top of the biological architecture. And then there are crystals that are part of the false light network that um, flash through your body. And you find a way to be able to disassemble all these things. There's also plastic polymers from microplastics in your diet. So of course, try to avoid microplastics in your diet. You know, it's one of the best things you can do. Stop drinking effing bottled water. Stop drinking effing bottled water. Stop drinking effing bottled water. It's terrible stuff. Buy it in plastic bottles at the store. You know what I'm talking about? So it's not pure water. It's got a bunch of crap in it. And then they're processed, the way of processing it. So you've got like plastic leaching into your water, but then you've also got microplastics. Every time you open up, and drink, you're drinking microplastics and the microplastics feed the nano architecture in your body. This is a Myron glass with not a regular plastic lid. And I'm so, I could drink out of a metal canteen or a glass thing. I will not drink out of the effing stupid, sorry. Don't drink effing puddled water. Don't drink it. Too, too upset to even talk about it. But stop ingesting microplastics. You know what else has microplastics in it? the paper cups that you get for to-go coffee is coffee to go. The lining of the paper cup is lined in a type of plastic that dissolves in the presence of hot coffee. And then you're drinking microplastics. You get a cup of microplastics and you pay $7 for your cup of microplastics. Please don't do it. Please don't do it. So save $7, buy a ceramic mug, make your own coffee. Um, and then, you know, carry it around with you. This is what I do. So stop ingesting microplastics. So I know I just gave you like a lot of information. I was very like mean also. I didn't mean to be so mean. This is a process to be able to get back to your inner capacitation. When I lived in San Diego, I was inundated by 5G and by all of the stuff that's in the air. I could barely sun gaze. It was very, very difficult for me to be my true self. And I had to get into a better environment. I had to get away from a 5G environment. So do that. Please do that. Get away from a 5G environment. That's the first thing because these fibers respond to and are fed by those energies. And organites are great, but they're passive. They're like tinker toys at this point. It's not enough to be able to do. You wear an organite suit. It's not going to be enough for it to do what you need to do in your environment. Because um, people are like, don't worry about the 5G. Like, I'll make more organites. I'm like, it's not enough. Um, you need to remove yourself from that environment. Stop drinking fluoridated water. Stop bathing in fluoridated water. Um, you can do holy basil, which is called Tulsi, T-U-L-S-I, and that will also help to clear out the pineal gland. Um, cannabis juice. Yeah, the THCA and cannabis juice absolutely helps to clear spike proteins and some of the other aspects of subcutaneous pollutions, even if you got them indirectly from other people, um, and also surely nourishes the pineal gland. So I'm a huge advocate for raw dietary cannabis. It's excellent. And also for CBD, which like you're not, it's not psychoactive. You're not going to get high on it. Do those things. This will absolutely help your pineal gland and or moose. I love the bamboo salts that come from um, the people at Dancing with Water and structure your water, okay? So doing these things, all of the physical things that I told you about, give you a little bit of wiggle room. Like they give you like this much space on your windshield that's defrosted and you can see a tiny amount. But even if you have a, like you're in a straight jacket, you have a little bit of wiggle room, that is what you use to be able to then fully extricate yourself. So you can do it it takes concerted effort at all times. And I want you to know with my mind, like I'm doing my email list, but I'm also doing these clearings through my body at all times. I'm walking my dog, I'm clearing my body at all times. I clear my body, I clear everyone else, I clear the neighborhood, I do, I do all these different things. You will find a way to multitask where you are doing important, regular mundane activities, like cook, your, cook your eggs or whatever it is, while you're also doing clearing out of this um, harmful pathogenic architecture. And um, yes, I, I don't want to say like, I don't want to say like, no one's going to save you. I don't want to give you a message like that. But I just want to say like, hmm, it's been five years. They do seem to be severely late. Better not wait on that because we got electrical cords that you got to coil up here. Okay. You got to de-invest yourself. So, um, and there are a lot of things that you can do. And the most potent thing is the spiritual stuff, but you can't jump directly to the spiritual stuff, which is what some people with a lot of spiritual ego are like, I don't need any of these remedies. I need to take methylene blue. I need blah, blah, blah. Just jumping directly to spiritual stuff. And I'm like, I'm 
pretty advanced and I needed to do, I needed to, to get out of San Diego. I need to take methylene blue and to take all these different good supplements. I need to, oh, I also, I do my, um, I vibrate. This is actually excellent. You can see this platform over here. It's a thing that you stand on that makes you vibrate very, very, very fast. And this absolutely helps to break up the nano architecture. Yeah, in the same way that like the zapping of the wand. So they're expensive. I was gifted with that. So I'm very, very pleased to have that. But if you can stand on one of these vibratory plates for at least five minutes a day, it jangles up all of that stuff. It breaks off their bonds. It makes it a lot easier for you to pass this stuff out. So I needed to take the supplements. I needed to stand on my platform. I needed to oscillate. I needed to do all these different things. And then I got to the capacity where I can do this work with just my willpower and my spiritual power and my, my psychic abilities. Um, and now I'm up to speed and I can, I can do it. And I still do all of the other things every day. I still take methylene blue and stand on my platform and do infrared. And you will also, you will benefit greatly from infrared sauna from very, very hot baths. Some people do hot bath with Epsom salts source your Epsom salts effectively so that they are not contaminated. And then it's in every food. Some people are like, no, do a strict raw vegan diet. It's in every food. I'm very, very sorry to inform you that they put this crappy bad stuff in almost every food, both vegan and vegetarian and carnivore. So you got to stop fighting with each other about what's your food source and how you eat eat as cleanly and non-genetically modified and effectively as you can afford to eat because food is so effing expensive. And um, please do not fight with each other about being spiritually inadequate if you're eating meat or whatever, because I have seen pictures of these fibers growing in cheese, in bacon, in vegetables, in, in chickpeas, it's in your environment. It is a pathogenic demonic invasion of your world like this is a bad note to end on i gotta end on something happier but uh it's a nightmare it's horrific it's in almost all the food and um so that's why people have good results with fasting but i don't advocate for fasting because that's very very um limited solution you know like just not eating it's very, it weakens you you have to eat food is light food is love food is essential for you to be able to reach the levels where you can eat the sun exclusively and not have to eat food from the grocery store. So you do not get to be a light eater through fasting. You get to be a light eater through eating a lot of very, 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 very highly caloric and nutrient dense, excellent food and building your light body and then being strong enough to not have to eat food anymore. You need to change your whole environment. You need to get change the electrical wiring in your house and in your neighborhoods and get rid of the effing satellites. I'm mad guys, very mad. Cause I live right here near Vandenberg Air Force Base and they send up these Starlink star poop satellites 10 million times a day, I'm exaggerating, at least twice a week, big sonic blast and they're sending more sky poops into the sky. It's not enough. And this is also why you can't have a spiritual ego about things because you're on a planet that now has so many um, satellite impediments circulating around you. It's, it's almost impossible for you to be able to connect with the sun and the stars. So, you know, the sun and the stars, especially when you sit out in your lawn chair at night, you're looking up at the stars. The idea is it's supposed to be an unhackable system because the stars are right there. And they're supposed to be like, yeah, we didn't have to build a clank like middle spaceship or any kind of apparatus to fly down or talk to you. Like I'm right here talking to you. And this is the problem. They put up so many satellites, so many 5G towers, so many repeaters and filled your body with so much of this. Stars are right there and you cannot F and hear them. This is not acceptable. It's not okay. And again, if you're trying to feed your baby applesauce and someone keeps on you know, blocking you from being able to get any of the food to your actual baby, you need to do something about it. So the sun and the stars are surely responsible and need to be responsive to the situation. That's all I can say. And in the meantime, I'm going to bring you guys applesauce because you're hungry and you need that. And you need to eat applesauce while you are developing into the capacity to eat pure light. So one day you will eat pure light, but in order to do so, you have to triumph in this battle, revolutionize your entire planet and purge of all of this technological infrastructure. And you're not going to want to have any technology. You are not going to want to have any technology. You're not going to be like this. Well, can I still have like my iPad and my headphones so I can listen to music? You're not going to want it. 
You're not going to want any of these cheap, stupid trinkets. You are only going to want to have a pristine world with you and your connection to sun and light and your real connection to the planet. That is all that you're going to want. And you will be so fulfilled, so entertained, and so non-requiring of anything else. You will laugh that you are like, but wait, my favorite songs. How am I going to groove back to my favorite songs? You will not want any of that. You will not want to draw or paint with pixels on your screen. You will not want to call people on a phone. You will have a completely different set of priorities and desires and how, how your desires are fulfilled. So I know this is a very up and down lecture that I don't want to apologize for. I'm sure I offended certain people. My intention is to empower you with real information and to share authentically um, my dismay at the things that I have experienced here alongside of you, because it would be very, very fake, very, very misleading. If I was like, la, 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 everything is fine. You know, everything is fine on the levels of pure light or higher dimensionality or uh, otherworldly beings or Christ network connection. No, there are very, very, very magnificent problems at every level of reality. If what I'm sensing or presuming is correct, it means large people with big giant cars have frozen windshields and aren't doing stuff that they need to do. Just please consider that. Please consider your mom's trying to get you applesauce. Something big and bad is happening that is preventing it. So ending on a very, very poignant and sad note here. Can somebody help me out? Getting comments? Comments? Oh, wait, wait, here's a comment. Thank you. Okay. Wait, here's also a good comment. Joyce says, I'm grateful for you. I love you. Thank you, Joyce. I received that and I love you too. Thank you so much. She says, I love you. You're a lovely soul and fortunate for us. You are here. Fortunately for us, you're here. Thank you so much for that recognition. Truly love you too. Thank you, Joyce. And Allison says, are the LED red light therapy panels effective? And the answer is yes, they are. I had one of those before I got my chicken light and I used it for a year and I feel like it worked pretty well. But then once I got the incandescent bulb, I was like, this is the real deal. So the LED light, it didn't get very, very hot. Like I could hold it directly against my body. And I certainly found positive um, effects in terms of like skin, collagen, rejuvenation and stuff like that. But the infrared chicken bulb, um, like I feel like it really cooks me through. Like I feel like it goes into my inner organs. I feel like it goes into like my spine. I feel like it deeply penetrates into my body. So like I don't have access to a sauna, but like that same feeling of when you go into a sauna and you just are like saturated with heat, that is really effective. Um, so yeah, the LED panels are pretty good but the incandescent bulb is even better. And Pedro says, love the sun gaze lasagna. Thank you very much. Let's end on a positive note and really do some envisionment work with the light that comes from the sun and your capacity to manifest and create reality. Let's coil up all the electrical cords. Let's envision re return to pristine architecture, justice, the capacity for you to connect with your mind to not only the sun and the stars, but really to all of us, to all nature, to, to be free in your body. This is this stuff here is such an assault. Let's envision a full removal of every speck of this from our whole entire um, biology, not only humans, but every animal and every plant in this world. Let's just envision that for, for total clearing of the atmosphere, total neutralization of all of that, um, all of that, um, you know, particles of those emissions. And let's also envision a return of the sun to its true qualities through perfectly pristine blue skies with none of these things um, coming between us. And this actually, I wrote an album called Under a Gentle Sun. And I wrote that in early 2021. And that was my intention. Because when I make artwork and paintings, I make it very intentionally for like the manifestation qualities that it does, you guys gotta know this about me. If you don't, I don't just make decorative artwork and songs, that it's all very intention. I'm writing and building, I'm making something with the music that I want to happen. So yeah, all of those songs that I wrote under a gentle sun, listen to the album, it's really good. Cause it also has the song called Symphony of Life about um, you know stars and their, life, their limited lifespan. Um, uh, I'm sorry, I'm clearly tired after a long, um, long lecture here, but 
Um, I want to be able for all of us to return to living under a gentle sun, beautiful, warm, golden sunlight that falls on your skin and feels amazing. And you can be outside in the sun all day and not feel like it's burning or glaring you. And also the gentleness of the sun as like the overseer, lover, parent, mm, guide, nourisher, all of that, all of that, that we haven't had in a very long time. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Allison's got a picture of a chicken and Steve says blessings, solar blessings. Thank you, everyone. Allison says, thank you. Amazing as always. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sometimes I doubt myself on these rants, but I have to let the information out. And the information is sometimes emotional, my emotional truth. Thank you for validating and witnessing my emotional truth, guys. Because I think that it's essential for me to be as real as I possibly can, because I think you can probably really relate to some of my qualms and feelings. And it's totally just for you to feel that way. And you're never going to get rejected by any higher dimensional being that was like, you doubted me, blah, blah, blah. No, very, very fair. All these things are very, very fair. And it's also part of what it is to be in a relationship. Like if you're in a relationship with the sun, you'd be like, hey, son, like you didn't do this thing. And this thing really needs to happen. And uh, it's totally fair for you to express your dismay. So thank you very much, everyone. I think it's time for me to go. We got to hug Cheeky. We got to take care of Cheeky and take her out for a walk. Maybe go to the park or something like that. So thank you so much, everyone.